Good evening, everyone. Welcome to this meeting of the Montgomery County State Delegation. I'm Delegate Julie Polakovich Carr, and I chair the Montgomery County House Delegation. Welcome to tonight's proceedings. We are on night two of bill hearings for local and bi county bills. These will be pieces of legislation we take up during the legislative session uh, in the General Assembly starting in January, but because they have a focus on Montgomery County, we are hearing them in our delegation first. Uh, this evening, we have 10 bills and a total of 42 witnesses signed up. And uh, as a reminder for folks who are testifying this evening, our bill sponsors have unlimited time. If you're here representing an organization, you have three minutes. And if you're here in an individual capacity, you have two minutes. Our very capable administrator for the delegation, Ralph Costas, is sitting at the end here. Uh, he does have a timer uh, that will go off when your time is up. And we ask you to please wrap up when you hear that. I think with that, let me turn it over to Senator Ben Kramer, who chairs our Senate delegation for his opening remarks. Good evening and welcome to everyone who is here this evening. Thank you for participating in the process. I like to say this is democracy in action and we are very fortunate to be able to sit down in a venue like this with people who are concerned about what's happening in local and state government and have everybody have the opportunity to share their thoughts and ideas on proposed legislation. So thank you all for being here and I'll turn it back over to the very capable chair of the House delegation. Thank you, Senator Kramer. So presiding over the proceedings tonight uh, will be the chairs of our local committees. So we're starting with the Metro Area Washington Committee and Chair Leslie Lopez. And I also just wanna acknowledge that we have a new vice chair for that committee, uh, Delegate Linda Foley. Uh, so Chair Lopez, I turn it over to you. There we go. Is that is that functional? Sorry, it's a new new facility for us at least. All right. Good evening, everyone. My name is Delegate Leslie Lopez, and I am excited to uh, proceed over the following three bills of the Metro Washington Area Committee. The first bill we have is PGMC 101-24, and uh, Kelly Kaplan will be providing testimony on behalf of WSSC. And while Ms. Kaplan gets settled, um, just as a reminder, um, this bill was introduced on behalf of our chair, and so we don't have a delegate who's uh, going to be providing sponsor testimony. We just have uh, support from the panel. Uh, just to remind everyone, as a bit of housekeeping, sponsors have unlimited time. Uh, but as William Shakespeare said, brevity is the essence of wit, and so uh, don't feel free to take unlimited time if you don't like. Um, people who are here speaking on behalf of an organization have three minutes, and organizations or individuals have two. And so with that, uh, Ms. Kaplan. Good evening, Chair Palkovich Carr, Vice Chair Shetty, and delegation members. My name is Kelly Kaplan and I'm the Division Manager for Customer Engagement and Advocacy at WSSC Water, and I'm here to testify in support of PGMC 101-24, Washington Suburban Sanitary Commission, Expansion of the Connection Pipe Emergency Replacement Loan Program. WSSC requested this bill, and we're very appreciative of the delegation for sponsoring this legislation on our behalf. We also want to take a moment to thank the Montgomery County Council and County Executive for supporting this bill. This proposal legislation will allow for the expansion of the program authorized by the Public Utilities Article of the Annotated Code of Maryland Section 23-205 to include sewer service line repair or replacement, camera investigation or snaking, and currently this program only covers water service line replacement. Additionally, the legislation would increase the maximum loan program from $5,000 to $10,000. The request would also extend the program's sunset date from 2029 to 2034. WSSC established this program, the Connection Pipe Emergency Replacement Loan Program. It was effective July 1, 2019, per resolution number 2019-2218, and Chapter 5.110 of WSSC Waters Regulations, which were adopted on April 17th, 2019, and expires on June 30th, 2029. There's currently $100,000 allocated in our annual budget for this program, and if passed, the amount proposed is to be increased to $200,000. 
The program provides loans to eligible residential customers to finance the replacement of their leaking water service line, and that's on their property connecting from the commission's service connection to the residents. This program is administered by WSSC Federal Credit Union, and frankly, despite a robust promotional plan, only six loans have been dispersed since the program kicked off in 2019, so very underutilized. The expansion of the program would provide an additional way for this funding to be leveraged by our customers, not only for water line replacement, but also sewer replacement. These repairs and replacements are often exceeding $5,000. And we also knew, know through the relationship and conversations with the Washington Suburban Master Plumbers Association, they suggested that we expand the program to include sewer repair and replacement. And since the members of this plumbing association that I just, mem that I just mentioned work directly with our customers, it really does seem that we want to listen to this insight and really make this loan program far more robust and frankly meet the needs of our customers. So this legislation um, does align with our financial stewardship priority. And this initiative would expand the existing customer uh, assistance program that we already have. And just to give you perspective, um, for the last few years, any remaining funds in the program at the end of our fiscal year do get donated back to the water fund, which actually helps our customers directly with their water and sewer bills through the Salvation Army. So with that being said, we respectfully request your support of PGMC 101-24. And I'm here to answer any questions. Thank you for your time. Sure, thank you, Ms. Kaplan. I have a, a, a quick question for you. So the, the bill concept itself is relatively clear and simple, but it's a six page document. And so I apologize in advance if I miss this, uh, but is there an educational component or like a public outreach component just to make sure this program is utilized? Yes, absolutely. And so we've leveraged the plumbing association. We've used a lot of the assets that we have, the website, bill inserts, um, social media so we want to continue to do that the reality is that it just hasn't been leveraged and we that's why we want to add the sewer because we know that sewer fails at kind of the same rate if not more than water so it's important to kind of add that in so customers have the flexibility gotcha. thank you of course and i'd like to open up by for questions i think there's one question by delegate kaiser madam chair you asked my question oh, thank you but i think delegate cullison though oh and delegate cullison Yes, so it is all based on, so just like you would apply for any loan, personal loan, you would go to the credit union and apply and based on your credit score, that is how the interest rate would be derived. So nothing special in that regard. Great, thank, you. thank you for the question. Okay. Any additional questions? No? Uh, Delegate Kaufman. Yes, uh, I don't know if you can hear me, but I can. I, uh, it's good to see you. Good to see uh, you too. My question is, you, uh, I assume that this is meant to uh, assist the most indigent customers that WSSC has, but if they um, if they still if it's treated like a traditional loan and they may not qualify, what is being done to ensure that this is in fact uh, helping the indigent customer uh, that it's designed to help? Because I can just see somebody filling out the paperwork and then oh boy, they can't qualify. Right. So so that is an excellent question. So this program is not earmarked for our most vulnerable customers. It's a really great question because um, July 1st, we're gonna be launching a new program that's gonna help our, our vulnerable customers with leaks on their property. So that could be inclusive of the water line, that could be inclusive of a leaking toilet, things of that nature. So that program, which we got approved um, last month by our commissioners, we're gonna launch in July. So that is what's gonna really be earmarked for our most vulnerable customers okay, so, so thank you for that question this exactly and and we have a very robust set of affordability programs that are really geared at helping all of our customers across the board because we know there are a lot of folks struggling Great. thank you madam chair thank you and i believe that is our final question so thank you miss kaplan thank you for your time thanks uh up next, we have uh, MC, or excuse me, PGMC 103-24, and that is a bill from Delegate Corman. Sure. Yes, please. Thank you.
Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, colleagues. Uh, I don't usually cite this as a job for bravery, but I did sit next to the Maryland Department of Transportation after all those budget announcements, so here we are uh, to present PGMC 103-24, the Washington Suburban uh, Transit Commission Reform Act. As you all know, the commission, or WSTC, is a bi-county commission. That is sort of how we organize our uh, relationship with uh, the metro system, WMATA. Um, it's uh, kind of an old statute, and uh, working with the department, we've found a few uh, ways that we could uh, improve on a little bit. One is to uh, make it so they're sort of very basic contracts, not their sort of overall allotment to WMATA. That goes through a lot of uh, a lot of budgetary process, but they're sort of more basic contracts. Don't require the approval of two county councils anytime they want to uh, do anything. Uh, another is uh, to standardize the language of um, how the transportation secretary now sits on the WMATA board, can have a designee sit in their place. Um, about five years ago, maybe six years ago now, we put the secretary of transportation on the board of WMATA to uh, improve that relationship, knowing that there would be times the secretary, uh, him or herself, could not be at the uh, board meeting. So there's a designee uh, position that's allowed under the statute. It needs some clarification to make clear what that person's powers are and when they can act in that capacity. And finally, because we added the secretary to the WMATA board, that created an issue between having Montgomery and Prince George's County members on the board and how that rotates back and forth. And so we have a little clarification on that piece. So kind of a little cleanup bill, on uh, a very old statute, and then some changes we made to it uh, six years ago. So with that, Madam Chair, if it's all right, I'll turn it over to the Maryland Department of Transportation. Please do. And I'm happy to uh, sit next to Delegate Corman in good budget times and bad, and, and happy to uh, be with all of you tonight. Um, good evening, uh, Chair Kramer and Chair Polakovich Carr, members of the delegation. I'm Drew Morrison, Acting Director of the Washington Area Transit Office at the Maryland Department of Transportation. I'm happy to be here this evening supporting PGMC 103-24, the Washington Suburban Transit Commission Reform Act that we've worked on closely with Delegate Corman. Um, and Delegate Corman, not surprisingly, did a great job of summarizing all of the core elements of the bill. Um, so I'll just highlight a little bit about what we're trying to do between the Washington Area Transit Office and the Washington Suburban uh, Transit Commission um, in being more of a think tank for Maryland on metro policy issues. Uh, our partners in Northern Virginia have resources through the NVTC to really dive into the policy issues at the heart of the metro system. And more and more, we want uh, that to be what we're offering to uh, the counties, um, to you all here tonight. How can we work through the key metro policy issues together? I've uh, been working over the last six months very closely uh, with the two counties. Uh, Director Conklin uh, jokes that he's seen some of us more in the last six months than some folks from MDOT over the last eight years, and we want to keep that uh, reputation up, and we want to be a resource. And so this re relatively simple piece of legislation is designed to help us understand how we can improve oversight, improve the functioning of the WSTC, and build a larger program of support for Metro and for all of you addressing Metro and local Local transit issues. Thank you very much. Thank you, Delegate Corman and Mr. Morrison. Are there any questions? And with that, we'll end our hearing. Up next, we have PGMC 113 24, and that is Senator Kramer's bill. Madam Chair, may I bring up the Montgomery County Director of um, uh, yes, you can, sir. And for the sake of formality, we will have two panels. So your sponsor panel and then the following. Good evening, colleagues. Ben Kramer introducing PGMC. 11324 Transportation Planning Local Authority. Um, colleagues, you heard a little discussion at last week's hearing about the work group that took place over the course of the summer that involved members of the Park and Planning Commission, members of the County Council, the executive branch, as well as residents of the county. One of the things that I note during the course of those meetings was that, and I'll be very frank with you, because my goal was to see us improve 
streamline processes here and ensure that the public is getting the very best out of its government. What I was disappointed to find was that much of the conversation when it involved commentary about improvements at the Park and Planning Commission were met by a very abrupt and stubborn response from the representatives of the Commission. Rather than embracing improvement in the process, they would dig in their heels and it became a turf battle. And I was very disappointed that that was the mentality of people who are supposed to be representing the best interests of our residents here in the county. One of the topics of conversation, and there was a lot of discussion and conversation about it, is issues around on-site transportation planning as well as master plan transportation planning. I will proffer to you that the Montgomery County Department of Transportation with myriad engineers who are there in the department and know what it is they are doing are in a position to fully grasp and understand what it is our road systems ultimately need to look like and to ensure that we are doing the very best. For those of you who represent the Bethesda area, much of the discussion was about how on-site commercial construction, apartments, commercial buildings, office buildings, retail, there have been problems with on-site loading dock facilities forcing commercial vehicles out onto our roadways, our right-of-ways, blocking sidewalks, blocking bicycle pathways because the designs that have been approved by the Park and Planning Commission are not affording these vehicles the opportunity to stage on site. They're getting pushed out into our traffic lanes, onto our sidewalks, blocking sidewalks, and Bethesda has been a huge problem. There were representatives of the Bethesda Civic Community who were there and very concerned. But this also goes back to Clarksburg and all kinds of traffic problems out of the designs for the Clarksburg communities. The bill before you seeks to address that problem so that final approval for these on-site plans rests with the engineers at the Department of Transportation who called out the problems that Bethesda is now experiencing. They saw it, they called it out, there was no change. The plans went forward as approved by the Commission and now the residents of Bethesda, the folks who are driving on the roadways in Bethesda, walking on the sidewalks, bicycling through Bethesda, are paying the price for the failures. So the bill before you seeks to afford the people who actually really know best with the right engineers to make final decisions about it. And with regard to master plans, this does not affect the Park and Planning Commission's ability to create 
master plans that show the type and size, locations and right-of-ways of road infrastructure or the desired character and intersection types. But what has happened over years is that the Park and Planning Commission has started to take what previously had been a responsibility of the Montgomery County Department of Transportation and they have usurped that authority and we have had problems as a consequence. The bill before you really doesn't change a thing except put into statute that the folks who have the best talent are the ones with the final decision. And I have with me this evening the director of the Montgomery County Department of Transportation, who I would proffer to you all, is the best authority in the room with regard to the problems that came up and were discussed at the work group and unfortunately were pushed to the side by the members of that work group from the commission. But it doesn't mean they don't need to be addressed. We have a responsibility to the residents of this county, to the commuters, to the pedestrians, to ensure, and the bicyclists, that we're doing the very best on their behalf. So with that, colleagues, I'd like to turn it over to Mr. Chris Conklin. Uh, good evening, Chair and members of the delegation. I'm pleased to be here tonight to speak about this bill. The bill has two elements, as described by the sponsor. Both improve the clarity of transportation uh, development review and master planning issues in Montgomery County. And as stated, neither, uh, neither transfers functions from the planning department to the Department of Transportation. If, if commenters are reading into the language that there's a transfer of function, I believe they're over-reading that language. It does not state anything is transferred. The first part of the bill simply provides the agency that's responsible for the safe operations, maintenance of county streets, pedestrian ways, and bicycles, approval authority for loading facilities that intersect with those roads, streets, and bikeways. This will allow the Department of Transportation to ensure that those facilities function as desired as mentioned, without blocking of bike facilities by trucks waiting to access those facilities or traffic lanes has, has been happening on Woodmont Avenue and Battery Lane uh, to access loading facilities. Uh, these things have manifest themselves in past approvals and while this law will not, or this bill will not eliminate the likelihood of those things occurring, it will reduce the likelihood of having negative impacts on our transportation facilities from loading and service. The second portion of the bill seeks to more clearly define the boundary between transportation master planning and transportation facility and design and operation. It does not limit the factors the planning department can consider as part of its work program, nor recommendations that the planning department and board can make regarding transportation facilities through functional studies, recommended practice documents, mandatory referrals, and collaboratively developed policies like the Complete Streets Design Guideline. It merely limits inclusion of detailed design and operational recommendations and master plans, which are prepared well in advance of site-specific engineering and operational studies that inform the design and operational requirements for these facilities. The bill eliminates the overlap between agency roles and reduces confusion by limiting master plans and only master plans to specific types of facilities recommended, the scale of those facilities, the nature of intersections, the general location, and desired character of those facilities. Based on the substantial framework in the master plans, which can be guided by more detailed analysis, the implementing agencies can make an appropriate and informed decisions about how to design, operate, and maintain the facilities. This provision will reduce plan recommendations that cannot be implemented and improve coordination between the agencies as a result. Obtaining acknowledgement and adaptation of master plans to reflect implementing agency comments has historically been a challenge. Master plan recommendations that are inconsistent with legal, regulatory, and engineering factors create substantial challenges for agencies who are responsible for managing the facilities and create unmet expectations for the public. Notwithstanding a difference of opinion regarding this legislation and some occasional conflicts about certain issues, which is natural among agencies with re closely re related responsibilities, MCDOT looks forward to continuing collaboration with the Planning Department 
to advance the county's transportation system. Thank you. I'm happy to answer any questions you may have about this legislation. Thank you, Mr. Conklin, and thank you, Senator. I think we have some questions. First, we'll go with um, Vice Chair of our committee, uh, Linda Foley. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I attended some of the meetings of the work group when Delegate Lopez could not uh, be in attendance. And uh, just to refresh my memory, um, Senator Kramer, or perhaps Madam Chair, um, wasn't this a right of way uh, issue dealt with some way with respect to the work group? Didn't they take some action on that? I have some recollection that they agreed to update the MOU uh, regarding that. My understanding is that there's an effort underway to update the lead agency memorandum of understanding, which identifies which agencies have principal responsibility for different elements of development approvals. That does not correspond to the master planning activity. That's simply the site development review activity. Um, this bill goes a step beyond identifying MCDOT as a lead agency, but gives an approval requirement for the loading and service design, which is one step beyond what is currently done in the development review process. Right, but as I understand it, this bill is in two parts. The first part deals with the right-of-way and the public easement and the on-site pedestrian route. And I thought that part was dealt with in, uh, by the work group with the MOU that was that yeah. they agreed to update the MOU on that. Delegate Foley, my understanding is that the MOU update is a recommendation of the work group. The proposed bill goes a step beyond that recommendation to require an approval of the loading and service design. Okay, thank you. Thank you. And the next question is from Delegate Foreman. Thank you, Madam Chair. First, Senator Kramer, I really thank you for your commitment of, to Bethesda. I want you to know that Delegate Love, Delegate Wallach, Senator Kelly, and myself are just as committed to Leisure World as you are to Bethesda, <laughs> so thank you. My questions are for Mr. Conklin. I'm just trying to understand the bill a little bit. The definition of plan, does that include what I think of as sector plans, like the downtown Bethesda plan or the West Bard plan? That's my understanding, yes. The Functional master plans and area master plans would be covered by this provision. Okay, so I understand, I, I think the, the sponsor's goal, which I won't ask you to comment on, but I think his goal is to um, not allow the planning board to impose very site-specific transportation elements. So for example, um, taking a lane from Little Falls Parkway and saying that's a goal of the sector plan, that probably would not be allowed under this bill by the planning board, is that accurate? Uh, my understanding of how a master plan would address that would be to identify the size and type of facilities desired for Little Falls Parkway. Now, Little Falls Parkway is not a county street. It's a parkway maintained by the Parks Department. So it's not well, let me pick a different example. Um, uh, if you picked a different road, like Woodmont Avenue, um, it would identify that we want to have a certain roadway width and a certain complement of pedestrian and bike facilities. But it would not specify elements like the crosswalk design, like the traffic signal timing, like the drainage design, like the specific location of striping and other controls. Great. And sorry, is there an example of when planning has done this that you could uh, I, me? I'm, I'm tired of giving this example, but one example on the Take pedestrian it. master plan was a recommendation for certain types of foundation design for traffic signal uh, supports or signage supports, which in our, in our view was well beyond the expertise of the planning department and not appropriate for a master planning type document. Great. So the planning board, though, doesn't actually put master plans into effect. Is that right? The master plans are developed by the planning staff, approved by the planning board, reviewed by the county council, and adopted, as are our project plans for specific projects. And does, can the council amend the plans, or do they just have to send them back to the planning board if they don't like them? Uh, the council often amends the plans. Okay. So can the council, if this bill was in law, put in, you know, whether Woodmont's going to have a certain type of drainage alongside the bike lane you put in or the foundation uh, on the crossings, or is this also taking the power from the council to make those changes? It's not my understanding that it affects the council's authority. I'd, sure. I'd have to get a legal opinion on that. I'm not I think I would really just encourage you and, and the sponsor to take a close look at that based on you know how the bill is. I don't think that's the intention, but I, again, I'm not a, an attorney that could give you that specific answer. Great. I'm sure we can clarify that in the committee. Thank you. Thank you, yeah. Madam Chair. Yeah, thank you, Delegate Corman. Uh, additional questions? No, I think that's it for the sponsor panel. Thank you both. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, all right. So our second panel is in opposition. Uh, we have Jason Sartori, David Onspacher, Carrie Sanders, Dan Reed, and Seth Grimes. Because I'm a visual person, we'll start here on the left with Seth Grimes. 
Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chairs Kramer and Plakovich Carr, Committee Chair Lopez. I'm Seth Grimes. I'm with the Washington Area Bicyclist Association, which represents over 1,200 Maryland members. We are active in particular in Prince George's and Montgomery County. Uh, WABA finds it appropriate and desirable that a general plan, a master plan, a functional plan, uh, and other types of plans include transportation operational considerations. The bill before you now would disallow these considerations in Montgomery County plans. Among the transportation operational considerations listed by the bill for disavowal <coughs> are stormwater management, location and requirement for traffic control devices, and standards and requirements for pedestrian and bicycle crossings, traffic stops, and lighting. The bill would strip the Montgomery, Montgomery Planning and the Montgomery County Council of their uh, authority, their role in planning uh, to an extent, and in implementing critical safety, stormwater, traffic management, and transportation policy measures. Uh, this is not a transfer of functionality, as the planning director said. It is an elimination of functional responsibility. So it's no transfer. It's an elimination of certain responsibilities from the authorities that currently hold them. Uh, Montgomery Planning and the Montgomery County Council have successfully and productively carried out this role for years. The current planning approach and processes largely work well. There's no good reason to change the current allocation of responsibilities. There are very good reasons to oppose this bill's proposed changes with degradation of Montgomery County transportation safety topping the list. I will further add an interpolation to my written testimony that if there is an issue with construction vehicles, I would suggest that it be addressed in a very targeted and narrow fashion instead of through a broad, blunt instrument approach, which is what I find this current bill before you to be. Uh, problems with construction vehicles shouldn't need state legislation to address them. Uh, this bill would make wide and radical changes to working and established processes. WABA opposes Bill PGMC 113-24 and asks you to uh, deliver an unfavorable report. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Grimes. Uh, Carrie Sanders? Oh, I'm sorry. Not good. Thank you. Uh, Chair Lopez and members of the delegation, good evening. I'm Jason Sartori, Director of Montgomery County Planning Department, and thank you for the opportunity to testify before you today. Montgomery Planning, the Planning Board, and MNC PPC do not support 113-24 because, let's be clear, it undermines the county's master plans, the public process associated with those plans, and the county council's land use planning authority. The bill specifies transportation elements that cannot be included in a master plan. This attempt to separate transportation elements from the land use planning is very problematic and will not serve our residents well. Transportation and land use concepts in urban planning go hand in hand. That is a long-standing industry best practice. That's how master plans and development projects create communities that enhance quality of life. This bill endangers that synergy and drastically weakens all master plans in Montgomery County. Removing significant transportation matters from the planning process would be an unprecedented limitation on the council's land use powers and would render the county's master plans woefully inadequate and incomplete. The bill would also make it less safe for pedestrians, bicyclists, and drivers if transportation analysis is not done at the same time and in coordination with the land use recommendations in our plans. We also have concerns about the bill's impact on the public engagement process. The public expects when the planning department engages them on a master plan that all related topics are on the table. Under this bill, answering a very common question that we get from residents such as, how will we mitigate the transportation impacts of the new housing or density proposed in a master plan would suddenly be outside the scope of our master plan process. If these components of the transportation network are decided by piecemeal decisions made by separate departments on a case-by-case -case basis, Montgomery County will end up with a fragmented transportation network that lacks the comprehensive cohesiveness that comes from the master plan process. Also, as you know, developers desire efficiency, certainty, and an easy to navigate development process. Master plans that are comprehensive help ensure a more streamlined development process. In contrast, this bill introduces confusion into development review 
and puts us at a disadvantage when trying to stay competitive with Northern Virginia and the district, not to mention every other Maryland county. Finally, I'd like to address the urban loading section of the bill. The issue came up during the development review process work group discussions. The work group chose to handle it by recommending unanimously an update and clarification to the lead agency MOU. Montgomery Planning has also engaged MCDOT, SHA, and other interested parties to conduct an urban loading study, which will be released next month. The study will further define the urban loading issue for us and inform those discussions with our partners over the MOU and help us identify appropriate solutions. This process should be completed before legislation is adopted. Thank you again for this opportunity to testify. Thank you, Mr. Sartori. And up next, we've got uh, David Onspacher. Hi, I'm, I'm David Onspacher, Acting Chief of Montgomery Planning's Countywide Planning and Policy Division. Thank you for the opportunity to testify tonight. I'm here to provide a bit more detail on why Montgomery Planning opposes Bill 11324. When we develop the transportation elements of a master plan, it is done concurrently with the land use element. That is the industry standard. It's the first thing you learn as a transportation planner. And the reason is straightforward. Plans that exclude transportation recommendations cannot ensure the community that transportation will be adequate to serve new development. It is also a standard practice to work closely with the County Department of Transportation and other county agencies on the transportation elements of each master plan. The bill prevents Montgomery Planning from including recommendations related to uses within the right-of-way, including sidewalks, bikeways, transit stations, and traffic lanes. Montgomery Planning needs to be able to make recommendations on these items to create effective plans. Transportation elements of a master plan cannot exist in isolation, or else they couldn't be implemented properly. Imagine if Montgomery Planning prepared the White Flint Sector Plan, the one that focuses on Rockville Pike, without considering transportation improvements. It would not have served the public very well. The bill would have prevented, uh, would prevent Montgomery Planning and the County Council from pre preparing the recently completed pedestrian master plan the I-270 corridor forward plan, and the bicycle master plan, since these plans are focused on transportation recommendations. More specifically under this legislation, the county's master plans wouldn't be able to discuss recommendations to achieve reductions in the number of vehicle miles traveled in the county, and how to achieve higher percentages of commuters who take transit, walk, bike, or participate in a carpool. These are two major components of how the county can meet its climate action plan goals and its vision zero goals, but they are also metrics which the bill would prohibit. The county's vision zero action plan specifically recognized Montgomery Planning's role and called for us to develop the pedestrian master plan, which the county council approved unanimously in October. The development of the pedestrian plan exemplifies the success of the master planning process and its collaborative nature. County agencies had multiple opportunities to weigh in during the plan and offered many suggestions for improvements, and they had a seat at the table at every turn, including four planning board and three county council work sessions. During the development of the plan, we met directly with our friend uh, Chris Conklin, Director of Transportation, and worked out the department's highest priority comments. Ultimately, the recommendations were vetted by the community, the planning board, uh, county government, and the county council. <coughs> This bill is fundamentally flawed. The premise that you can disconnect transportation planning from land use planning will not serve the public interest, and the bill endangers a collaborative structure between agencies that is critical to forming plans at work. Thank you. David, thank you, Mr. Onsbacher. Now we have Carrie Sanders. I'm Carrie Sanders, Chief of the Mid-County Planning Division at the Montgomery County Planning Department. Thank you for the op opportunity to testify today. Removing transportation planning from community planning process would result in inequitable outcomes such as higher cost of living, pollution, and overall lower quality of life. We have seen how transportation planning decisions, when coordinated with land use decisions, fuels economic growth and creates a sense of place. For example, the Bethesda downtown plan creates higher densities of housing and jobs by transit hubs, as does Silver Spring and North Bethesda. 
These are important economic centers for the county that were carefully planned with the community making jobs, housing, and other amenities convenient to transportation choices. Our neighbors in Virginia and D.C. also follow these national best practices. A diversion from this approach would be detrimental to our communities. A county that is one of the nation's leaders in the life sciences industry must plan for the growth of biohealth job hubs in conjunction with thinking about how workers get to their jobs and how do they get to their homes. To remain economically competitive, Montgomery Planning must look at planning communities comprehensively. For example, the Pike and Rose development along Rockville Pike in North Bethesda is now a major destination in the county. Under this legislation, the project would have not happened. Transportation was central to the master plan that led to Pike and Rose. New streets were created <clears throat> out of neighborhood blocks, excuse me, new streets were created out of existing surface parking lot. Modeling transportation scenarios was done to ensure those streets would disperse traffic and prevent bottlenecks, creating walkable areas and bringing new riders to North Bethesda Metro Station. As Montgomery County competes with many other places to live and work, it is critical that creating places like Pike and Rose to support people who live, work, play in Montgomery County continues to happen through coordinated land use and transportation plans. Lastly, the Veers Mill Corridor Master Plan relied on coordinated transportation and land use planning. It planned for the transportation and land use at 4010 Randolph Road, which started construction with over 190 units in 2022, shortly after the master plan was adopted. This project provides affordable housing at various incomes with direct access to future bus rapid transit along Veers Mill Road. Doing community planning and transportation planning comprehensible, comprehensively is vital to Montgomery County's economic health. This bill threatens our economic competitiveness. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Sanders. And to finish us, we've got Mr. Dan Reed. Uh, good evening. Hi. Uh, my name is Dan Reed, and I'm the Regional Policy Director for Greater Greater Washington. We're a nonprofit that works to advance racial, uh, economic, and environmental justice in land use, transportation, and housing across Greater Washington. Uh, I'm also an urban planner and a District uh, 20 resident. Uh, we strongly oppose uh, PGMC 113-24 as it would severely curtail Montgomery County's efforts to make its streets safer for walking and bicycling, among other things. Uh, this bill, as I understand, would prevent the planning department from making re uh, recommendations about the location or design of sidewalks, bicycle lanes, and transit stops in its master plans. We believe this is a mistake. For decades, planning department's role has been to lay out the county's overall vision for transportation. And as has been described here, has master plans in place for highways, transitways, pedestrian, and bicycle facilities. DOT's role is to execute the projects identified within those plans. Montgomery County as a whole has set a goal for Vision Zero to eliminate all traffic deaths by 2030. And doing this requires the coordination of many different counting agencies. Uh, DOT relies on planning to do its job and vice versa. Uh, additionally, the way the bill is written, it, it dictates the planning department would only be able to make recommendations about the location of nodes, links, and required rights of way. Uh, I worked as a transportation planner for a decade uh, for a consulting firm uh, serving communities across North America and here in Montgomery County. I've uh, worked as a contractor for Montgomery County DOT and for Park and Planning. Uh, I cannot tell you what nodes or links mean uh, because they don't have formal definitions. Uh, were this bill to pass, defining this vague terminology would be at best a massive roadblock and at worst make this bill unenforceable. Uh, we have a saying in transportation that the best transportation plan is a good land use plan. It makes sense, it just makes sense that the planning department, which is charged with land use planning, to consider both land use and transportation in its work. Uh, this is especially important now because as of October of this year, 36 people have been killed on Montgomery County roads, the highest amount we have seen since 2007. Uh, every single one of these deaths is a tragedy, and it is not clear how this bill would improve the county's ability to address this ongoing crisis. Uh, we ask the county delegation to give this bill an unfavorable report. Uh, thank you for your time and consideration. Thank you, Mr. Reed. Are there any questions from the delegation? Uh, Delegate Collison. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I have to say I'm puzzled <laughs> because I heard each of you say that the best planning is done collaboratively between park and planning and transportation. And yet you each said 
park and planning is the, the driver, and I heard you say, Mr. Reed, DOT is just an implementer. I guess I'm wondering what the opposition would be to codifying the collaborative relationship and making sure that in the master planning, the, tra the Department of Transportation is involved and, um, and has an active role in the planning to make sure that the, um, the ultimate outcome is works for all of our community. So I guess, Mr. Sartori, I'm going to look at you uh, to answer. Sure. Thank you, Delegate. Um, I would say that absolutely it is a collaborative process. Uh, we do engage not just the Department of Transportation, but the State Highway Administration and other county agencies, too, beyond transportation relief. Uh, it is, it's absolutely necessary. When we talk about the, the need to, to, to be, the, you cannot consider the land use recommendations of a plan without understanding the impacts that they have on transportation. And you can't consider transportation elements on a separate process without understanding the context that the land use provides or, you know, just doing that jointly at the same exact time. So what we're saying is that this process needs to happen at the same time. Not, it, it's unclear in this bill what process would be followed to, to, to provide the, the things that wouldn't, no, would no longer be eligible to be put in master plans or would suddenly be stripped from every existing master plan. Um, so that's where there's a lot of confusion over this. So we, we're saying it's absolutely necessary that the process considers both of these. We have transportation planners, we work with the Department of Transportation, and we fully integrate that all right into our master plan efforts. Uh, yes, please. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Mr. Sartori. So um, if the bill were able to capture the concept of the importance of the multi-agency approach and actual authentic partner in the planning I'm, uh, and each agency using its particular expertise, would that be acceptable? I would say that we would find it difficult to have anything that says that a master plan which ultimately is not the planning department's plan, it's the community's plan, and it's ultimately adopted by the county council. They are the ones that decide what goes into those plans ultimately and what goes out uh, or isn't included in those plans. And so I, I would say anything that indicates that a master plan can't, this is the first time I've ever seen a bill, we get a lot of times from the state, we get, you know, a master plan must include this type of element, that type of element. I've never seen anything that says you can't include a conversation around this particular topic. Um, and so uh, anything around that we would not support. Uh, the idea of, I, I have to, I still, I'm new in this role, but I'm not new to the planning department. And I, when, when Mr. Onspacher mentioned our friend, Chris Conklin, director of the Department of Transportation, that's completely genuine. I believe that we are really good friends and I'm uh, eager to continue to collaborate and work with MCDOT. Uh, and if that's through an MOU between the two agencies about how we'll engage each other in our respective processes, we can do, we can explore something like that. We've done that with MCPS, we're in the process of doing that. And, and so we could do this with multiple agencies explaining how we will interact with each other. Thank you, Delegate Colson. Other questions? Madam Chair. Uh, Senator Kramer. Thank you, Madam Chair. And is it uh, Mr. Onspacher? Is that? You got it. Oh, okay. No, I'm sorry. The gentleman who was just speaking. Yes, I'm Jason Sartori. Thank you. Um, following up on Deli Cullison's excellent question, um, and maybe <coughs> there was a little bit in the translation lost between the goal of the bill and bill drafting's language in drafting the bill. Clearly, the goal and intent was to ensure that recommendations with regard to the master plans remain with the concepts, but looking at final pro work product where we ran into this issue during the work group of lead agency, where the Department of Transportation has called out problems that came out of the transportation designs from park and planning. Those concerns came to fruition and now are problematic. Would you offer what you think is an appropriate amendment that provides 
the goal and the intent of ensuring that there's a final decision maker with the employees who are best qualified to take a look at the work product from park and planning and say, we, we see faults here in the transportation design sector. And clearly, as Mr. Conklin was trying to point out, in the final engineering where there's been mission creep from park and planning coming in and saying, well, we want to see the following that clearly now is mission creep in Department of Transportation responsibilities. Between, we've got lots of time between now and when this bill will be heard in Annapolis. Are you all prepared to try to work with the Department of Transportation to achieve the goal if, in fact, the drafting of the bill by legislative bill drafting did not achieve uh, in its entirety the, the, the concept and idea and focusing on that lead agency problem of which there was great discussion during the uh, work group. Okay, uh, thank you, Senator Kramer. Um, I, um, I will try to address this in the two different, there's two different elements to this bill, right? So the, the, the question about the urban loading piece is one that relates most directly to the development review process. And um, as I mentioned in my testimony, that this was something that was discussed in the development review process work group. Um, and you, as, as you've indicated, this is something that needs to go through and be part of a discussion about that lead agency. And so the, the work group decided that this would be best handled through a discussion around that, the updating that lead agency MOU. Um, but I, I want to also be clear that the in, through the development review process, Issues about the design of the buildings and, and, and or the urban loading areas are not done in isolation by the planning department or the planning board. This is, goes through a process that involves input and uh, input from DPS, the Department of Permitting Services, and Montgomery County Department of Transportation. Uh, they contribute to the recommendation that goes to the planning board. Um, I also mentioned that we are and they doing, flag problems, sir. They, they flagged concerns, and those and those are brought. Through, through the process. What I would suggest is, again, we have a study that we've been working on in conjunction with MCDOT and with input from MCDOT and SHA that's taken a look at this issue without kind of giving too much information about what we're finding in that. I would say that it's, it's less, it seems to be less of a design issue and more of an operational and an enforcement issue. Uh, and this was exacerbated by a lot of the changes that occurred to how curb space is used and how urban loading areas are used coming out of the pandemic. And so this is something that we need the study to fully define what the issue is. It's, it, it, it may not be it's a design issue that's, that's being decided by the planning board or during that development review process. And so let's see what the issue is and then figure out the best way to address it, not preemptively make some decisions here about who would be the lead agency, because that's essentially what this is saying when we have a recommendation from the work group that says, here's how we'll handle lead agency. With regard to the other the elements of this bill that pertains to what goes into plans, um, we've heard for a long time uh, that our plans sometimes tend to go into the operational realm. Um, there is a process that we go through with these development, with 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 uh, development of our master plans, that and I'll talk specifically about the pedestrian master plan because that was brought up before. That's that's okay. At this yeah. point, you've answered my question. I asked whether there was an opportunity to try to work with the commission between now and when this bill will be addressed further in Annapolis. That was my question. Thank you very much. I'm hoping, and it springs eternal, that that might actually happen. But after the work group, I, I'm not so sure. But thank you, sir. Thank you. That's my question. Thank you. Other questions from the delegation? And with that, concludes our hearing. Thank you. And concludes the three bill hearings for the Metro Washington Area Committee.
Thank you, Chair Lopez. So next up, we'll be uh, calling upon Chair of the Land Use, Transportation, and Public Safety Committee, Chair Sarah Love, for these bills. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, we will start with MC 1924, Montgomery County Speed Monitoring Systems Publication of Notice. Sponsor, Delegate Laura Charcutian. Delegate Charcutian, the floor is yours. Thank you. <coughs> there we go. Uh, good evening, colleagues. For the record, Delegate Laura Charcutian uh, here asking for a favorable report on MC 1924. Um, it's so fun to be back in this structure again. Gosh, I can't wait for the legislative session. Um, <laughs> so uh, this bill is uh, simple, and it's for the children. No. Um, <laughs> this, uh, so basically, as you know, many of our bills that are uh, sort of adding things like speed cameras require uh, some kind of publicity, which, of course, we absolutely want from the uh, transparency side of things, but historically we've often met that we've often said that that has required that that things be published in a daily newspaper. And because at this point, sadly, because of the situation of local journalism, that daily newspaper is now only um, the Washington Post, which is a very expensive way to require the county uh, to distribute information to folks about the fact that a uh, potential speed camera may be going to a new location. And so uh, what this bill does is it just uh, changes the requirement from requiring the publication in a um, uh, journal of uh, daily circulation and so now um, other kinds of publication and in particular websites uh, is sufficient but more importantly I think when folks are looking for the opportunity to engage in, in uh, public processes uh, if they want to weigh in on the placement of a speed camera for example um, they are more likely to uh, look on websites than to go through uh, looking in uh, portions of uh, paper newspaper and so um, with that I can take questions um, ask for a favorable report. Thank you, Delegate Turkudian. Uh, Delegate uh, Foley has a question. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Delegate Charcutian, um, my question is, and maybe I'm just not, I mean, this is a very short bill. It's not very much language in the bill. Um, does it, does this, um, so this takes it out of the news, it, 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 the way this bill reads, it makes it sound like um, except in Montgomery County, you don't have to do anything. That's not what you intend, right? I, I think it has to do with the fact that it, no. So this is a local bill because the way that, uh, as I understand, state law is written around cameras, um, there are different rules in different jurisdictions. And so this is a local bill, and so it's the, in Montgomery County, here's the rules that apply to Montgomery right. County, which is why it's here's a local bill, and then it's taking out the section that says, um, published notice yeah, of the location of speed mining system and the general circulation in the jurisdiction. So what it says, except in Montgomery County, that's not accepting that entire paragraph, just the newspaper part. That's correct, yeah. Okay. I didn't read it that way, so. Okay, just, if there's a drafting error, we can definitely fix that. Uh, it may or may not be, but I just didn't read it that way. I read that the whole thing was exempt, so. Okay. But that's not your intent. That's not my intent. The okay, intent is you. that in Montgomery County, you don't have to publish it. Okay, the, thank yeah. you. Mm -hmm. I think you turn it off. Sorry. <laughs> thank you, Delegate Foley. Uh, Delegate Vogel. Thank you, Madam Chair, and hello, Delegate. Uh, do you know if in Montgomery County right now, is it only the Washington Post that these are being promoted in? There's not another paper of daily circulation. Understood. Yeah. Okay. The print in print, right? Okay. Which is the which that is, is the requirement, requirement yeah. of daily mm -hmm. circulation. Okay. Uh, I mean, unless I'm yes, that so that is, and so it's like. In 2022, I think it cost the county like ten thousand dollars or something, which you know it's not, it's, it's not insignificant. It's but you know we, when we think about you know being in tight budget times, it's not um, you know we'd rather spend that on something else. Right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Seeing no further questions, Great. that concludes the hearing Thank on you. MC 1924. We will turn to MC 1124, Senator Kramer. And this is a. District 19 bill, Madam Chair, so I don't know if my D19 colleagues. It's going to be awfully lonely all by myself. <laughs> without, without my D19 team. 
the fight in D19. All righty then. Well, good evening again, colleagues. Ben Kramer to introduce MC 1124. And I am very pleased that uh, Delegate Corman expressed his appreciation for my concerns about the well being of the Bethesda community. And I am hoping now is an opportunity to reciprocate that love um, as this is an issue that is very important to many of our up county or mid county legislative districts, including districts 19, 14, 39, and 17, all of which have some portion of the intercounty connector uh, going through their legislative districts. This is not a new bill, colleagues. Um, I'm hoping this is an issue that you're somewhat familiar with. Um, and that issue is that there is significant speeding and racing on the intercounty connector, and it is a danger, and it is definitely impacting the quality of life for all of the communities and neighborhoods contiguous to this major east-west arterial. Um, the bill looks a little different than it did previously, and what the bill would provide is that the Maryland Transportation Authority would place four speed cameras that can be moved in various locations on the intercounty connector. Speed cameras do not require a law enforcement officer to pull over a vehicle and write a citation. They simply record that a vehicle that is speeding at, for what it's worth, 12, 12 miles over the posted speed limit. So for those of you who are not familiar with the ICC, at 72 miles an hour, they would be exceeding that speed and they could be ticketed for that. This is a simple answer to a significant problem. In the past, the bill was set up so that, as is done elsewhere in Montgomery County, that local government would deal with putting the speed cameras in place. That's the way it was originally requested when I first reached out to MDTA. Now, based on a letter of concern that they issued at uh, last year's bill hearing, they indicated, well, why aren't we the ones getting to decide where the cameras go? Why aren't we coordinating the cameras? Why aren't we getting the revenues for the cameras? And as far as I'm concerned, I'm fine if that's what they would prefer. So this year's bill does just that. Puts the responsibility in the hands of the transit authority and provides that they'll find the locations and they'll collect the revenues. They also raised a concern at last year's bill hearing that it violated their agreements that revenues and, uh, and such that are generated by the intercounty connector go to the Transportation Authority. They do now under the bill. What I would ask is that when community members coming up behind me to discuss this bill express to you the problem and we have a mechanism to help address that problem that you hear them and that this year we finally move forward on this issue to 
provide increased safety and to afford an improved quality of life. You know, there was a bill that came in a few years ago that I think was going to, uh, that sought to increase the speed to something like 70 miles an hour on the ICC. At that time, there were studies that indicated that for every five miles per hour that cars go over the original posted 55 miles an hour, the volume of increased noise goes up dramatically, dramatically. The sound barriers that were built when the ICC was first constructed were designed for 55 miles an hour speeds. The speed limit was increased to 60, but there are cars doing well above 75 and 80 miles an hour on the road, and it is having a significant impact on the quality of life for thousands of residents that live along the right-of-way for the ICC. So I hope you all will listen to the folks coming up and that this year we can do something to address those concerns. And uh, I thank you for your time. Certainly welcome any questions. Thank you, Senator Kramer. Uh, yes, Delegate Spiegel. Thank you, Senator Kramer. Uh, as somebody who uses the Intercounty Connector quite often, I appreciate your efforts here toward safety and, and promoting safety uh, on that highway. Um, my question is actually in, in relation to Delegate Charcutian's bill that she just presented. I noticed that um, in the, the, the section of the code that your bill addresses, there is also a requirement uh, that State Highway uh, publish uh, in a newspaper of general circulation notice of the location of any speed cameras that they would place onto the ICC. Uh, and I'm wondering if you just, as the sponsor, have any thoughts about that or have had any conversations uh, with uh, the state agencies about that as well or whether that might be something that would be the topic of a potential discussion of friendly amendment down the road in terms of this requirement, particularly uh, if these are uh, mobile cameras that are going to be moved around more frequently uh, the idea that there would have to be a continuous publication in the Washington Post paying for at legal ads to notify the public as opposed to simply using a website. Thank you. Very good point. Thank you for that. A friendly amendment would certainly be welcome. And, uh, and I will point out that it does require posting on the road. Um, and I would hope that it would just simply be generic posting periodically along the intercounty connector, just letting people know that uh, you know speed monitoring is utilized, and uh, and try to provide some calming measures uh, for traffic there. And I will point out, all of us received uh, maybe about th two months ago, three months ago, a report from the Maryland Transportation Authority when they actually did do. Uh, enforcement on the intercounty connector, um, the numbers of tickets were off the chart because people are accustomed to just speeding on that roadway. And part of the issue is that it was built for traffic 50 years out. So while traffic continues to grow on the intercounty connector, it was built to afford traffic going through the middle of the century which allows for it to be kind of wide open and, uh, and been a real issue with speeding and racing. Anybody else? Questions? No runs, no hits, no men no left on base. That's it. <laughs> Thank, Thank you, you Senator Madam Chair. Kramer. Okay. Next up, we have Robert Zimmerman, Helene Rosenheim, John Sang, Matt Quinn, Mark Friedman, William Kassman, Mindy Baden. You can just take a seat.
Okay. Uh, like my uh, colleague next to me, we are just going to start here and work our way down. So please. I believe you do. Thank you. There you go. Thank you. Madam Chair Love uh, and uh, members of the Montgomery County Delegation, my name is John Seng. I'm a founder and chair of Safe Roads Maryland, and uh, our formal incorporated name is Maryland Coalition for Roadway Safety. We incorporated in Maryland last year and uh, in the most unbelievable achievement in my life, achieved 501c4 status with the IRS. So like we're really here. Um, uh, hopefully we're out of business next year when we reach vision zero, but <coughs> who knows. Um, I think uh, well, first off, to start off with, Safe Roads Maryland unconditionally uh, supports the passage of MC 1124 uh, and asks for your recommendation, your favorable uh, report out of this bill, which will effectively slow down drivers on this roadway via safe, equitable, and efficient means. Um, I want to thank Mr. Kramer and uh, uh, also uh, Sen uh, Senator Zucker and their respective delegations uh, to, the, uh, to the Montgomery County delegation and in Annapolis. But let's take a look at the big picture in Maryland uh, road safety for a moment. Uh, we're on day 338 of the year 2023, and uh, our the toll, you know, talk about toll road, but the toll of uh, fatalities on Maryland roads is 554. We're well on our way towards 600 roadway fatalities, the highest in 17 years in the state of Maryland, um, running completely counter what's going on in the rest of the country. Uh, NHTSA, National Highway Transportation Safety Administration, um, announced mid-year a 3.3% decline. So what's going on in Maryland? We don't know. This bill by itself is not a panacea. How many lives will it save? We don't know, but I kind of liken it to house-to-house -house combat. We've got to start doing the right things, and especially tools and mechanisms and employing technologies that we know will work and work equitably and safely. So. Um, just to keep uh, moving along here, I want to um, cite some specific data, uh, the current, most current data we have uh, for the past, uh, I believe, five years. In four out of five years, MDTA uh, has reported increased numbers of crashes um, uh, ending in the final year. They measured uh, where we have data in 2022, an increase of 49 crashes in the, the most recent two years, a 57 percent spike uh, on an annual basis. Uh, including seven fatalities uh, in the years 20, uh, 2020, 21, and, 20, and 22. So we have also seen an increased uh, incident of at what's called average reportable crashes per million miles on the ICC from 12.4 uh, to 26.8 in the years 2018 to, to 2021, an increase of 46% from the baseline. So as Mr. Kramer pointed out in his opening remarks, this road already is uh, dangerous and unsafe and due to these high speeds. Um, and he pointed out with a 72 miles per hour uh, before anyone would be ticketed by a speed camera, that is just coincidentally happens to be the median uh, or the average speed currently on the ICC. So that means half the cars are going higher than 72 miles an hour, maybe 75, 80 in a 60 mile per hour zone. Mr. Sang, if you could wrap it up, please. Thank you, I will. So let me just conclude by saying I would appreciate your support for um, Bill 1124 and ask for your favorable review. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Mark Friedman. I'm a 38-year resident of Montgomery County. I'm also the president of the Hollowell Homeowners Association, a 647-home community in Olney, Maryland, fairly close to the ICC. I'm concerned with speeders on our residential neighborhood side streets, and I'm even more concerned with the speeders that I witness on our main highways to include the ICC. Respectfully, I'm testifying before you in support of Bill MC 11-24, the Montgomery County Speed Monitoring System on Maryland Route 200. I believe speed kills, and we need to make our roads safe for the law-abiding drivers. Here's how we can make a difference. I'll start with a quick story of the starfish thrower that you may have heard. Little boy walking along the beach, picking up starfish one by one, throwing them into the ocean. An elderly man walks by and asks, what are you doing? The boy answers, the tide is going out. If I don't get them back into the sea, 
these starfish will die. The man replies, there are thousands of them. You can't possibly make a difference. The little boy responds by picking up a starfish, throwing it into the ocean, and saying, I just made a difference for that one. The man went home, thought about it, and the next morning joined the little boy on the beach in support of his mission. My mission is to help save lives in Maryland on the highways. According to the Zero Deaths Maryland.gov website, we saw the following increases in just a five-year period between 2018 and 2022. Total traffic fatalities increased almost 10 percent from 485 to 532. Motorcycle fatalities increased 32 percent. Speed determined as a major factor in deaths increased 38 percent from 71 to 98 cases. That's almost 20% of the fatalities are attributed to speed. If you're driving on that ICC, you see the people that we're talking about. Excessive speeding on the ICC is recognized and threatening problem. We may not be able to stop every speeder on the ICC. However, every violator that we do catch, fine, and convinced to drive safer makes it more bearable for the rest of the law-abiding drivers on the ICC to drive with less fear of becoming a traffic statistic. Thank you for your time and support of this extremely important bill. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Michael Helton. I live in the Sycamore Acres, which borders Route 200. I support MC 1124, although I consider it a very minor step to solving the problem of speed bikers racing along the ICC at speeds well over 100 miles per hour. These speed bikers cover their license plates, tune their engines to make more noise, and have total disregard for the law, travelers obeying the law, and local family residents in otherwise peaceful neighborhoods. The police are not allowed to chase these speeders, and they should not for safety reasons. A cursory count of family residences in front row view of the ICC is about 1,239. John's house is one of those. These families are disturbed by the noise of the speed bikers more than nine months of the year. The Montgomery County government and law enforcers need to do their job to control speed, noise, and safety on this residential highway. A side note, I live a third of a mile from the ICC and it sounds to me like uh, when the speed bikers are running along the, on the road, it sounds like a uh, three lawnmowers right outside your front door. I would strongly advocate that a speed monitoring system that is, is used on Route 200 consider the use of drones for spotting and collecting data for future use, including to track where the speed bikers go. Uh, this data is needed for assessments on how to track and arrest these speed bikers, which the law enforcer should be doing. Drone technology and capability is advancing rapidly and is a tool which should be considered for this use. Thank you for your attention to this problem. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Mindy Bade, and thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak this evening. Mark here spoke about starfish. I'm going to speak about box turtles. <laughs> when the ICC was being built, the Maryland State Highway Administration funded a research project pertaining to the relocation of box turtles from the ICC limits of disturbance. The turtles in the path of the ICC construction were removed, they were fitted with a shell-mounted mounted radio transmitter, and they were relocated to an area off of Moncaster Mill Road. Researchers, which included my daughter Holly, used handheld telemetry receivers weekly to locate these turtles and make sure that they were surviving and thriving in their new environment. And that research went on for three years. A lot of care and concern was shown to these box turtles, but now the ICC is built and many motorists are traveling at a very high rate of speed, endangering the lives of the citizens who are traveling the speed limit. The care and concern that was there for the box turtles seems to be non-existent for people driving on the ICC now. Last year, we were hopeful that speed monitoring systems would be, be placed on the ICC, but the bill was watered down so that speed indicator devices were placed there. 
these devices are being ignored by the motorists driving 80, 90, 100 miles an hour or more. Please show the same care and concern for our citizens as was shown the box turtles and approve Bill 11-24 for speed monitoring systems on the ICC. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. I'm uh, Helene Rosenheim. I'm president of the Greater Olney Civic Association, known as GOCA. I'm a longtime Olney resident and community advocate. Nearly 50,000 people live in Olney with a median age of about 42, based on the 2021 census. Founded in the late 1960s, GOCA today represents nearly 40 homeowner and civic associations. And central to our mission is to advocate and promote the overall civic, economic, economical, and ecological and cultural welfare of the community within the um, Olney Master Plan area. Maryland 200 inter intercounty connector cuts through nearly three miles of Southern Olney, the only major highway in Olney. GOCA did not oppose the state's plan to, all, to, to build the ICC beginning in 2007, although we did argue at the time that with the development, the way that the development had progressed during the years since the road had originally been planned, it really made more sense to move the road further north. Um, the expectation at the time was that this highway with a planned 55 mile an hour speed limit would be a safe road. However, since that time, the state increased the speed limit to 60 miles per hour. Unfortunately, extremely few drivers respect the revised speed limit. The latest figures from the Maryland Transportation Authority police indicate average speeds between 70 to 72 miles per hour. Given the illegal speeding on this highway, any crash carries a much higher degree of risk of injury and fatality. Crashes on this highway have continued to rise over the past several years. GOCA understands from firsthand reports from the MTA police and Montgomery County police that significant shortages in their staffing um, impacts their ability to patrol roads versus responding to 9-11 felony calls. When the state built this road, the Olney community stood by with the expectation that the state would take every and any means possible to ensure reasonable, convenient, but above all, and I emphasize above all, safety first. The speed of many of the offenders on this road make physical apprehension difficult, so we encourage the use of technology such as these cameras that will contribute to making our roads and our residents safer. We're counting on you, our state elected officials, to work together with Maryland Transit Authority officials to ensure that safety comes first on this highway, cutting through, cutting through and used by our community. We appreciate and fully support the speed monitoring devices bill MC 1124 proposed by Senator Zucker and Kramer and co-sponsored by delegates Cullison and Crutchfield. On our roads, safety must come first in Olney and throughout Montgomery County and Maryland. Thank you. Thank you. I'm Robert Zimmerman, president of Brook Manor State's Homeowners Association. For better or worse, our community sits right next to the ICC. And whenever there's good weather, we don't need to go outside. We just listen for the motorcycles and the big room. And as was mentioned, you can hear it inside, outside. Many of our residents say they can't even use their decks. Um, and some people are quartered a half mile away from the ICC. Brook Manor has been working with both the MDTA police detachment responsible for the ICC and the MDT executive team for at least five years. Uh, we've met with them. We've gone to Baltimore, Browning Highway and met with them. But unfortunately, uh, we do very much appreciate all the time they took for us. Uh, but we've seen little concrete action. And a lot of it, they've said that the regulations prevent them from doing things. So we're hopeful, hopeful that some of these changes will allow them to do what the MDTA police has told us they want to do. But they say their hands are tied by the regulations. We've seen increased enforcement periodically, but nothing to make long-term difference. There seems to have always been a reluctance, not from the police, but from the MDTA management team and leadership to do something about this. We're frustrated. Speed cameras do work. We've seen them work. I travel a lot. That's my job. I've been on Route 28 Norbeck Road. They put up and they reduced it to 35, and it's made a difference. If you've seen any of the construction areas on I-95, they put the speed cameras up and people slow down. If you know anything about Baltimore and Jones Falls Expressway, 
it was a traffic nightmare and a uh, accident nightmare they've put speed cameras up and it has reduced speeding and accidents so speed cameras do work i travel the icc daily as do many of our only and rockville and silver spring neighbors we have all seen the average speed creep up, creep up. mdta police said it's now 72 miles per hour COVID and the defund police movement have given people the idea they can drive any way they want, and we see it every day. The ICC has become the, a speedway where cars weave in and out of traffic at 80 miles an hour. Motorcyclists do the same at 100 miles an hour, and if you've been there, you've probably been passed by one. And trucks downshift going 70. The noise can be deafening, and as was mentioned, you can sometimes hear it a mile away. There is no reason not to implement speed cameras on the ICC. Speed cameras can help reduce reckless driving, improve road safety, and reduce the road noise that is affecting the quality of life of nearby residents. Therefore, Brook Manor Estates community and all of the other communities we've talked to, because we've been very active on this, that sit next to the ICC strongly support the bill 1124, and we really hope that it can be passed by the legislature this year. Thank you all for your time. We do appreciate it. Thank you. My name is William Cashman. <clears throat> I live, I don't have an association or anything. Like, we don't have any of that stuff where I live. I live near the corner of the ICC and New Hampshire Avenue. I have less than 2,000 feet from my house to the ICC. And I do support uh, Senator Kramer's bill. I want to say that what everybody's talking about, the noise, the motorcycles, which I've uh, encountered a lot and everything else like that. I don't know how many people here actually live on the ICC or near it, and I'm not judging anybody on that point. But the thing is, is that when I first moved there 22 years ago, that place was the quietest place on earth. And then it came in and it's gotten louder and louder and louder. And you go out onto that road and it's getting even more and more and more dangerous. I have been out there and I've had between me and that person right there, maybe a little less than that, motorcycles just shooting straight in front of me, you know, almost hitting me. You know, the MT, uh, the ICC police, they're wonderful people, they're good people. I have never had any problems with them, uh, but I have problems with traffic from that where I live. You have to gauge how you're going to pull out because coming southbound on New Hampshire Avenue, all the traffic that comes off of there, you know, it's impossible to get out at points in time. I know about that. I just want no more noise, or less of it at least, and the speeders to come down. Listen, I've been on the Daytona 500. I've gone around that track at 200 miles an hour, and that's with a professional driver. What these people are doing is insane. I wouldn't even do it, even when I was young. Thank you, and I really support this bill. Thank you. Do we have any questions for this panel? Delegate Acevedo. Can you hear? Perfect. Um, thank you all so very much for your um, for your testimony. Uh, very enlightening. Uh, I think it's certainly an issue that's concerning for all of our constituents. Uh, I think for me, when it comes to this issue, there's always a balance because. Uh, I get a lot of emails from constituents about uh, uh, too many speed cameras going up. And then you also get uh, uh, emails from constituents that we have too little speed cameras, right? So it's always um, how do we strike that balance, but obviously public safety being the, um, the concern here. So I guess um, how would you all respond to uh, folks' concerns that, you know, I mean, this is too, talking about 200, but that there are a number of other um, uh, roads, county roads, state roads, where folks would like to see speeding um, uh, come down, uh, would like to see speed cameras, um, and don't disagree with you know some of the stuff that I heard. But how do you, uh, I guess, balance that when you're hearing from other folks concerns about uh, uh, speed cameras uh, for other roads, county roads, and state roads as well? Um, we don't want a situation where we have a proliferation of speed cameras, and that's something that the District of Columbia is now dealing with right now, and a lot of frustrated residents 
very pissed off at the the the, the municipal uh, government there and we obviously don't want that um, uh, here as well so if folks can respond to that and then secondly I wanted to come to um, a statement that I heard in um, uh, someone's testimony about uh, um, you know sort of defunding the police um, in genders like folks um, I guess speeding or what have you and I'm having difficulty understanding that connection so, sir, if you could help me understand how okay. um, folks, how defunding the police or, or anyone calling for like a reallocation okay. of resources I'll, I'll perpetuates speeding. Um, but if you could answer the first question first about like just some of the concern okay. from constituents. Um, Thanks. I'll answer both just because uh, the first one, I think the ICC is a unique situation because of the speed, the straightaway, the traffic. Um, and I think people take advantage of that fact. It was mentioned it was built for a lot more traffic than it carries right now. I mean, traffic c continues to be increased. Um, so there's, it's become like a speedway. So to me, it's a unique situation. We don't have a lot of roads in Montgomery County that are the open like that. For better or worse, and I, maybe worse, we have a lot of congestion. So it's very hard to speed on most of the roads in Montgomery County. ICC, for better or worse, is more open. Um, and that's what, to me, makes it unique. Um, and I'll answer your other question so other people can say, when I said about the fund, we've talked to the MDTA police quite a bit and also the county police. And what I'm saying by that is they say a lot of those initiatives have made it harder for them to recruit. Okay, there's a shortage of staff. You may not believe it, but the police keep telling us that, that there's a shortage of, and over and over again, they say they can't do all they want, they can't staff the positions. There's a shortage. We know the county government is offering very high bonuses. So I'm just going on that fact what they've told us, that it's, it's made them very hard to recruit and to staff because we've asked for more police from MD, and they say, well, we just can't hire them. So that's the reference. That's the tie to it. Yeah, so and, and just wanted to follow up. So there's generally and what we've found is that all across the board, like, you know, hiring retention is, is somewhat, something that's difficult. Yeah. Um, and what I'm hearing you say is that, um, you know, there's a problem with hiring retention and it is not defunding the police is what is perpetuating speeding because that's what you, you know, okay. said. And okay. so that's, to me, I, I, I found it hard to follow. But okay. what you're saying is, is that we need more recruitment and retention, which I don't disagree yes. with. But to be very clear, folks calling for reallocation of resources does not perpetuate speeding. I agree. All right. Thank you. Thank you, so Madam Chair. I'd like to be able to comment to uh, Mr. Astavero's uh, first first question regarding the um, the balance as you uh, as you uh, raised that issue, sir. Um, I've been working on this for uh, as long as uh, Mr. Zimmerman uh, stayed about five years now, and uh, what hooked me on Safe Roads Maryland uh, was meeting a handful of folks like Mindy Baden here to my left, who've lost family, lost family members, loved ones due to DUIs all across the board, all the reasons that people lose their lives. Speeding is the number two cause of uh, roadway fatalities in the state of Maryland. And as I uh, brought up and illustrated earlier in my comments, that number is going the wrong way. And uh, whatever the reasons for um, decline in uh, law enforcement and stops on roads, of any kind of road across the state, Whatever's behind that, staffing, allocation, funding, budgets, what have you, recruiting, um, it's it, the, the lack of enforcement on our roads also plays a heavy contributing factor to the rise in speeds. I like to point out to people who've ever seen the movie Jurassic Park, once the dinosaurs figured out, wait, there's no more electricity in the fences, we're going to jump the fences and wreak real havoc on that island community. Made up story, but I think the analogy applies. So we know. Speed cameras work. It's technology. It's not perfect, but what is perfect in our world, what is uh, paramount and permanent is when someone uh, loses a loved one, a family member, uh, the folks I know, I've met firsthand. Why I'm so passionate about this is that every day they wake up, it's like the death in their family just happened the day before. And if there's something better than anyone in Annapolis or in a committee or your constituents, if they have ideas about something better than speed cameras where they just got a ticket and they complain to their delegate, please solicit those ideas so we can employ uh, more palatable and more effective means to control speeds on our roads in Maryland. Thank you, sir. Thank you.
Any other questions? Oh, yes. Delegate Chi. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you for all of you for advocating for road safety. So my question is about this dynamic speed display, which is, I think, probably what the state decided to do instead of the speed camera as like an interim step. I personally like the idea of a dynamic speed display. Uh, not highway roads, in the neighborhood roads, for example, I requested one for North Potomac in our community because I noticed the speeding uh, not excessively, but somewhat of a speeding that affects kids running around and all of that. And I thought real-time display of how fast you are actually driving could be a real-time deterrent. So my question is related to the data. Do you guys know if uh, whoever, you know, like a SHA, do they know if there are any data informing them if the behaviors changed because people saw how fast they were actually driving? since we put up those dynamic speed displays. Okay, um, I've noticed this because I drive down the ICC a lot and so does my family. Um, I've noticed that when people see that sign, I've noticed this over the weekend and over the last week when I first saw those up, that people do notice it and they do slow down because they're, they're looking at that and they're thinking, well, this is what I'm thinking, they're thinking is that there might be a cop a little bit down the way, you know, but I have seen people slow down a little bit. Now, then you got the people with the cars and everything else like that. One thing I did want to say about the fines and everything that come from speed cameras, we're not the District of Columbia. We do not use that as a cash cow. That's what's keeping, believe me, I spent a lot, I spent a lot of money paying speeding tickets for years in the District of Columbia, okay? But this, if you put it up on your sign, and say, hey, you know, there's going to be speed cameras, you know, but not exactly telling them they're where, then if you're going to be stupid enough to go past it, then you're stupid, you deserve it. You know, I mean, that's just the way I feel about it. Um, I also spent a lot of time in Delaware, and they put up those speed um, alerts, like you're mentioning, almost in all the neighborhoods. They seem very active to do it. Um, and the one I happen to have a place in Bethany, um, they did a study. Um, the city and it did show that it reduced speed but I think it's because the other thing you need in there is there's always a uh, officer as was mentioned somewhere down the way a little bit looking to take and I think it's that combination of the flashing sign saying you're going over but the thing might be the bigger deterrence is the officer down there that's ready to write you a ticket but in combination there's been studies that show it works Delegate Mayor North. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. So I have a, a few questions. One to follow up with Delegate Xi's point about the data. I, mem I can't remember who it was, but someone testified that these indic speed indicators are being ignored. Is there any anecdotal data as to that happening? I, if I misheard that, please correct me. But is there anecdotal data as to that actually happening? only what I've seen myself on the ICC driving. Um, I think the people who are aware of their speed and who want to go kind of near the speed limit, it is helping slow down. But then I've seen motorcycles blow by at like 90 miles an hour and they could care less what those speed indicators are saying. Okay. So yeah, so I think the speed cameras would be a big help to slow those people down. Okay, thank you. Uh, my second question is that there was something mentioned about um, once the speed increased to 60 or from 55, 60, there was a problem. I, am I hearing that correctly, that has the problem exacerbated once that speed limit increased? Have you noticed that in, um, in the time that you lived in this community, in the ICC? Yeah, I've definitely noticed. I take it to Columbia um, almost every day. And I think, you know, it's the old story, people will go 10 miles over or 15 miles over. So if you raise it to 60, they're all going now 70, 75, when they were all going, you know, 65, 70. Um, so yeah, I have definitely seen an increase um, and definitely an increase in the motorcyclist, you know, going way over that. And my, my third question is, um, I know recently, Montgomery County, if, if not the first in the state, first nation, I'm not sure, um, talked about the availability of drones in solving crime. Um, maybe down the road, it's not so it's a state issue, but hypothetically, if we happen to have a drone monitoring this, would that be a reasonable alternative to speed cameras, hypothetically speaking? 
Oh, yes, I, I was the one that mentioned the drones. Okay. Um, yes. And I believe the uh, Montgomery County Police has a drone department. I'm not sure how active they are, but the drones usually don't go faster than about 55 miles an hour. Mm -hmm. uh, but we've been working on strategies to have a couple of drones uh, on the ICC that could track where the speed bikers are going. And uh, the speed bikers don't care about the police. As a matter of fact, they laugh at police when they pass them by because they know the police won't chase them. And they don't care about speed cameras because they cover up their license plate. And uh, so uh, the, the, uh, the bill is good. The uh, MC-1124 should be done. But this is a baby step, and they need to do much more, okay. especially for the speed bikers. Okay. And be aware that drones are, um, because of the wars that we have in the world, uh, drones are now a, a military tool. And they are advancing technologies every day. And uh, soon they'll be having uh, drones with uh, more technology than we can have on the road. So uh, that will come maybe in a year or two. Thank you. Okay, seeing no further questions. Um, is Mr. Matt Quinn here? He's, he's, he's too far delayed, so I'm sorry. He's not okay. going to be able to. I All think right. he. That concludes oh, the hearing. Madam, Madam Chair. Oh, yes, I'm so sorry, Delegate Kaiser. No, it's a, a, a late question. Uh, Ms. Rosenheim, you seemingly wanted to answer that last question, too, and I wanted to give you the opportunity. <laughs> I was just, in terms of things getting Thank worse, uh, Senator Kramer had mentioned as the speed goes up, the sound level goes up, and, this, and the sound walls were built for the lower speed. So when the motorcycles are going 100 miles an hour, the, seed, the sound walls are not very effective. And I'd like to add to that very quickly that um, I did some deep diving uh, homework. Uh, MDTA conducted a study amongst uh, potential, uh, amongst current uh, travelers of the ICC at the, when things were still 55 miles per hour to find out what would be their reaction if they could drive 60 miles per hour. And I mean, unsurprisingly, uh, they were all in favor of it, all the drivers in the ICC. The one audience that MDTA did not uh, solicit an opinion from were the permanent residents 24-7, 365 on the ICC, which is why, because I think if they had, if we'd have known, uh, it, they wouldn't have been such smooth sailing. So, but thank you for your comment, your questions. Okay, now I believe that concludes the hearing for uh, MC 1124. Thank you all, appreciate your time this evening. And we continue the Senator Kramer show with <laughs> MC 1224. Thank you, Madam Chair, for your indulgence. Uh, Absolutely. Mr. Gino Ren, if you could join me at the table. Thank yes. All right, good evening again, colleagues. Uh, ben Kramer introducing MC 1224. Um, the first thing I want to point out is that if you have a draft of the bill from what's online, um, real fast, I've put at everybody's desk this evening what the bill actually looks like now. You also received a copy online. Colleagues, this is a bill that would afford, if they choose to do so, the uh, uh, attorneys in the state's attorney's office the opportunity to participate in collective bargaining. Um, this issue was brought to my attention as I believe there have been some members of the department who have inquired about being given that opportunity, and I want to share with you. From my perspective, this is not casting any doubt on the way the office is run. Um, our state's attorney, I think, does an exceptional job and our state's attorney is what I would refer to as a personal friend. And uh, so that is not, I'm not,
casting any dispersions about our state's attorney and the operations of the office, and certainly providing the opportunity for state's attorney, members of the state's attorney's office to bargain collectively is going to go well beyond our current state's attorney's tenure. This bill is about the fundamental right for these employees, if they choose, to have the opportunity to bargain collectively as they do next door in Prince George's County. Now, the bill before you was originally drafted to look just like the Prince George's County bill and law. However, in response to some concerns that were raised and brought to my attention by the county attorney, our council, and our executive, they wanted to see something more specific, and what they suggested and what is now before you is the template that we have used for our sheriff's department and passed last year um, to qualify some of the issues involving the sheriff's department. That is the template that you have before you. It provides that, just as with the sheriff's department, that for matters with the state's attorney's office that relate to fiscal matters, to pay, that's negotiated with the county executive because the county executive funds that office. And for matters related to work and similar issues, that's negotiated directly with the state's attorney. Um, so it's not particularly complex. It's what we did with our sheriff's department, and I would simply say it is what I believe is consistent with what this delegation has done historically, that when our public employees have sought the opportunity to bargain collectively, that we afford them that opportunity if they choose to pursue it. Um, with that, I have the president of McGeo UFCW Local 1994, and uh, I'll ask him to offer his thoughts on the legislation. Thank you, sir. Madam Chair, Senators, Delegates, uh, it's a pleasure to be in front of you. Back in June of this year, a significant number of assistant state attorneys reached out to our union and uh, began discussions with us about the possibility of becoming represented for the purposes of collective bargaining. Now, I want to underscore what Senator Kramer said in his opening remarks. This, um, this desire has absolutely nothing to do with how they feel the department is run. Let's be very clear about that. The fact is that their budget, the state's attorney's budget, is fully funded by the county executive. It must be approved by the county council. They are the only agency in the county government that receives either partial funding or full funding from the county executive and approval from the council that does not have a seat at the budget process table. They are totally shut out of any discussions regarding what their budget should look like. That inability to voice their needs in terms of wages and related benefits is non-existent. As a result of that, they have fallen terribly behind other competing agencies to include the county attorney's office. I believe over the last 12 to 
to 18 months, the state's attorney's office has lost about four assistant state's attorneys to the county attorney's office simply because they pay more. Keep in mind, they also compete with the federal government's attorneys and other attorneys, not to mention private firms. So they are, are in a very competitive market and they have no way at all to influence what their compensation looks like. So regrettably, despite the fact that many of them chose to work for the state's attorney's office because that's what they want to do, they want to prosecute cases and put bad guys in jail. But they can't in many instances when they're struggling to keep pace with their colleagues in other agencies and within their profession. So I want to be very clear about that's the motivation. Now the way the process would work is the same way it works for the county sheriff's office. It would be, and you folks, this delegation uh, may recall that you supported an amendment to the sheriff's law last year to allow, to clarify when binding arbitration uh, was affected, effectuated during negotiations. Uh, so you should be familiar with that process. The employer record for wages and benefits and all economic items, if you will, would be the county executive. If and when this bill is passed, those employees would sit with the executive and bargain out their wages and benefits. When it comes to working conditions, as is the case with the sheriff's office, those employees would sit with the state's attorney, whomever it may be, and work out their working conditions. So that's the intent of the bill. Uh, as Senator Kramer mentioned, this delegation has a long history, a long history of supporting the expansion of employee rights, specifically when it comes to granting and passing and supporting enabling legislation across the state of Maryland to allow our public employees in the state of Maryland to engage in collective bargaining and have a seat at the table and deal directly with their employers. And I, on behalf of the employees of the state's attorney's office, is, uh, am here this evening to respectfully request that you continue that tradition and support this bill. I'm here along with the other two lead uh, elected officials from the union to answer any questions. Thank you, Madam Chair. Senator Kramer, thanks for the bill. As you both noted, we have a long history of uh, supporting bills like this. We don't need their consent, but I am curious if the state's attorney is waiting. I didn't see it in the bill file, if the state's attorney has taken a view. I, I am not aware at this point in time what the state's attorney's position is on this right now. So Are you seeking uh, I don't want to not? represent one way or the other the state's attorney's position. Are, are you seeking was, the, his views or? I beg your pardon. Are you seeking the office's views or? Uh, I am more than welcome to hear the, I, I, let me say this. I think because there was this original bill and now this replacement bill that the state's attorney's office has been, and I don't want to speak for the state's attorney, love him to death, um, but I think because we knew this was coming that I think the state's attorney wanted to have the opportunity to take a look at what was going to be the final work product before weighing in on the issue. And since the document you have now may not even be the final document, this has not gone to the amendment office yet. Okay. All right. I, to Senator, be drafted, so I, I... Okay, so I, we don't know yet. I would just say, I think it's not you. a need to know, but it's a good to know. We don't need this sure. consent, but I think it'd be good. Senator, Senator took care of it. Thank I, you. I could add to that. 
Question. The okay. state's attorney, myself, and the county attorney are in ongoing conversations to try to understand his concerns and hopefully eliminate his concerns. Great. He's concerned about the management prerogative side of the out, but it, he supports, it, and I'll say that because he's told me several times, he supports, he understands the value of his workforce having a seat at the table during the budget process, i.e. through collective bargaining. Great. Thank you both. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you. Uh, Chair Corman asked my question. Thank you, Madam thank you very Chair much. and colleagues. You're done with me for the night. <laughs> Happy holidays to all of you. You warm up. <laughs> I was off. Majority Leader Moon. Uh, sure, I'll sit. Take a seat, any seat. <laughs> um, good evening, colleagues. Uh, I will hopefully try and be brief with this pair of bills, um, but we'll start with MC 624. Um, this is a repeat of a bill we saw last year. So for folks who are new, I will um, do a very quick refresher, but it takes school bus camera fines. Um, there are currently cameras mounted on all of the MCPS school buses, and if you fail to stop when that arm comes out, you get a $250 ticket. In past investigations, we've discovered that 70% of those tickets are being issued not for people behind the bus, but for people coming from the opposite lane, um, and you don't get that ticket if the, if the road has a median. So over the years, we've tried to focus people on these engineering solutions because we have bus stops that have collected over a million dollars in fines, but no improvements have ever been made to the road to actually make that school bus stop safer. And the numbers of violations are increasing, so we're leaving the kids in that dangerous scenario. So what this bill, MC 624, does is it would take the share of the school bus camera fines that's collected on state highways and use that money to make those school bus stops on those state highways safer. So hopefully there won't be fines and we'll have safer kids. They cannot currently do that because the fines are collected by Montgomery County and they have no ability to fix state highways. So that's what we are trying to fix with this bill. Um, if you were paying attention to the trajectory of this bill, it got turned into a statewide bill which we then voted out of the House last year, 110 to something, so huge number. Um, and that bill was about giving people in that opposite lane scenario a warning the first time they got one of those tickets, which is another way of handling this. So I would ask the indulgence of this body to go ahead and send this revenue bill over to the full standing committee I would appreciate um, the delegation's support and indulgence on that matter so that the Standing Committee can have the full ooh, array of options as to how to deal with the school bus camera issue in front of them. There are two other bills that you will see that are not Montgomery County bills. They are statewide bills because this issue is now spread into other counties that have used the same vendor. Um, so you will see some bills attempting to tell school systems to stop putting school bus stops on eight-lane um, highways with no medians um, and to look at other alternatives. And you have the warning system bill that was proposed last year and passed 110 to something coming back for hopefully another vote. So again, I hope to get these bills into a work session so we finally see some resolution to this issue this coming legislative session once and for all. That is my hope, and there'll be three options. So happy to take any questions about this one. Thank you, Mr. Majority Leader. I'm sure uh, Chair Corman and Delegate Stewart and I uh, on the ENT Motor Vehicles Subcommittee are looking forward to those bills. Are there any questions for the sponsor? Okay, seeing none, I will call up Seth Grimes, Peter Gray, Dan Reed, 
Allison Gillespie. We'll start on the end. Oh, turn my mic on. Is it on? Yeah. Uh, county delegation, uh, I my name is Peter Gray, and I am the chair of the board of Bike Maryland, a statewide bicycle advocacy organization with hundreds of members in Maryland, and we support MC624. It would require, as you know, that the balance of fines collected by Montgomery County as a result of violations on state highways by school bus monitoring cameras be applied only to enhance pedestrian safety at locations where the violations occurred. As reported by Montgomery Planning and MCDOT, the vast majority of serious injuries and fatalities due to crashes occur along the county's arterials. Georgia Avenue, Old Georgetown Road, Veers Mill Road. These are all state roads and are most in need of measures to enhance safety for those walking, biking, and using other mobility devices. We place cameras on school buses in order to monitor and hopefully deter bad driver behavior that endangers school kids and other vulnerable road users. And we hope that uh, use of these cameras is an appropriate measure will make sense and to apply those fees uh, from fines detected by the cameras to enhance safety on those state roads. So we call upon you to advance MC624. Thank you. Thank you. I'm Seth Grimes. I'm Maryland organizer with the Washington Area Bicyclist Association. Our mission includes fighting, centers on fighting for a just and sustainable transportation system where walking, biking, and transit are the best ways to get around. Safety, especially for vulnerable users of our roads, walkers, bikers, uh, people in scooters, in wheelchairs, is, uh, is absolutely essential. MC 624 would require the balance of fines collected by Montgomery County as a result of violations enforced on state highways by school bus monitoring cameras be applied only to enhance pedestrian safety at locations where the violations occurred. <coughs> Montgomery planning reports, quote, most serious injuries and fatalities are located along the county's arterial, such as Georgia Avenue, Old Georgetown Road, and Beers <coughs> Mill Road. These are examples of state roads as are the vast majority of Montgomery County's most dangerous roads. The aim of school bus monitoring cameras is to deter bad driver behavior, driving that is illegal and endangers <coughs> school kids. Enforcement via monitoring cameras is a safety measure, and it is entirely appropriate and sensible that the balance of fines be applied to enhance pedestrian safety at the location of violations. Waba therefore recommends that you advance MC 624 and work in Annapolis to enact this legislation. Thank you. Thank you. All right, good evening. Um, hi, my name is Dan Reed. I'm the Regional Policy Director for Greater Greater Washington. Uh, we support Bill MC 624, uh, which would direct fines for violations on state highways enforced by school bus cameras to pedestrian safety projects in the areas where those violations occurred. Funding for pedestrian infrastructure is limited, and as a result, communities can wait years for something as basic as a sidewalk to be installed. I, I know I'm waiting for one in my neighborhood. Uh, as of October 2023, 36 people have been killed this year on Montgomery County streets. We need to use all of the tools available to make those streets safer and prevent further tragedies from occurring. School bus drivers, sorry, school bus cameras go off when a driver passes a school bus while the automatic stop sign is out suggesting that violations are likely to occur on multi-lane roads where drivers can speed and where students getting off or on the bus are the greatest risk of being hit by a speeding driver. Uh, <laughs> by using funds from those violations in the locations where they occur, we can prioritize the streets that most need to redesign to calm traffic and improve safety for children walking to and from the bus, um, amongst others. Uh, we ask the county delegation to advance this bill, and thank you for your consideration. Thank you. Any questions for this panel? Delegate Foley. Thank you, Madam Chair. Actually, my question is for um, uh, Delegate Moon, the sponsor. Um, maybe the panel, too. Um, I, I, have you read the comments from um, SHA, from the State Highway Administration on this bill? Okay. Well, um, they just in, submitted an informational letter 
and one of the paragraphs in the letter talks about uh, maybe using the funds not just for infrastructure enhancements, but for education and outreach, and I wondered if you would be open to their suggestions along those lines. Certainly. Um, though I've made the claim oftentimes that if you actually go granular and look at satellite imagery for where some of these locations are, they are very high volume commuter corridors with seven, eight lanes, you know, into D.C., um, Colesville, Connecticut, Old Georgetown, Wisconsin, River, right? All, all of these are high volume, and so I really am skeptical of whether you can scale an education program to catch the thousands of randos driving down these roads every day, because they're, they're the, I really think engineering solutions are needed and warranted in many of these scenarios. You'll hear me make a comment when I uh, testify on Delegate Solomon's bill about the use of the word accident, or I should call it misuse, uh, to describe traffic collisions or crashes. Uh, these aren't accidents because they are eminently predictable, maybe on a statistical basis, uh, because we design our roads badly. We design them to favor traffic that moves fast, uh, drivers in cars. Uh, to disfavor pedestrians, including school kids who might be crossing to or from a bus. So uh, these are uh, not uh, truly accidents. Uh, engineering solutions, as Delegate Moon just said, are what's indicated here. Driver education won't get you very far. We need to redesign our roads to make them safe. Uh, we need to redesign our intersections and our school bus stops. I, I would just concur with that. You know, I, I've in a previous role worked on safe routes to school projects both in Montgomery County and throughout the state of Virginia. And you know, when you're standing waiting for the school bus on a road like University Boulevard, you know, education is not going to help you when there is three feet between you and and perhaps death. Uh, the, it's not enough. It, it has to go to actually improving the infrastructure where these things happen. Thank you. Seeing no further questions for this panel, I thank you all. Um, is Allison Gillespie here? She's not coming? Okay, great. With that, um, we conclude the hearing on MC 624. And uh, Mr. Majority Leader, you can turn to 1024, please. Um, great, colleagues. This is another holdy but a goody bill. Um, MC 1024 <laughs> deals with the topic of speed limits. Um, for, again, for those who have been here in prior years, you may be familiar with this concept. If you're new, um, generally the state law says what default speed limits are in a range of roads. It's 15 miles an hour for Baltimore City alleys. It's 30 miles an hour for most residential and business districts. Um, and so years ago, we got a request from the county um, when Council Member Hans Riemer was there and they were undergoing some Vision Zero um, and pedestrian safety measures, and they asked for the ability to diverge Montgomery County from the state's uh, speed limits to give the county the ability to go as low as 15 miles an hour on some roads. So this body said okay, the, um, the assembly passed this, but stuck two conditions on there. One was no speed cameras on those roads where this has been done. And two was you couldn't make these changes um, until you had done a traffic and engineering study. So in prior years, folks asked us to try and reverse the decision on the photo enforcement question, and we were rebuffed. And so in this year, um, WABA is coming in and asking for a revision to the traffic and engineering study uh, with the understanding that it, it adds cost um, to jurisdictions. I will tell you in perfect candidness that there was um, a goof and uh, a alternate version of the bill went up online different than the one you see here. But I'll just go ahead and explain to you what those two versions were so you can sort of get a sense of where this conversation is heading. The bill that you have before you as introduced says repeal this requirement for a traffic and engineering study. Um, I've gotten some feedback for, with questions about this, um, so we can explain more, and there will be some folks up here um, coming up after me who will uh, explain why they like that proposal. The alternate version you saw 
uh, sought merely to exempt the county or municipalities from that traffic and engineering study if the road in question was already part of a complete streets or functional master plan or some other type of policy analysis that already included that road. So we were looking at a spectrum of repealing fully this traffic and engineering analysis requirement and to trust the county and city discretion to um, handle speed limits, again, on their own county and city roads, not on state highways. Um, and the alternate version that was um, put up earlier uh, would have simply exempted them from that requirement had a um, functional master plan or complete streets um, plan or some other survey already been done that included that road. So with that, I hope we can make some progress um, getting our counties and cities a little bit of uh, leeway and discretion. And I will turn it over to some advocates who would like to talk about this. Delegate Moon, I have a clarification, clarifying question. Yes. Um, so are you putting forth the repealing bill? The is repealing the bill promoting? is the bill that's that's going forward. Okay. There was, there was accidentally that other version that was posted up, but I, I'm just going to be candid that it's it sort of gives you a window into the discussion we were having about how to draft this bill. Got it. Okay. Yep. Thank you. Um, we would welcome back Seth Grimes, Peter Gray, John Sang, Dan Reed, Jason Sartari. Welcome back. By now, you gentlemen know the drill. We're going to start on the end and work our way down. So if you have a particular preference to go first, you know where to sit. <laughs> I, I uh, joked to your colleague uh, Dave Ansbacher earlier that this is Montgomery Planning's bills uh, in a way for reasons that I will get into uh, speaking even though you're the planning director is sitting next to me. Uh, so, uh, uh, Mr. Grimes, we're going to start at the end. Oh, we are. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Although I do look forward to hearing what you have to say. Um, uh, so, uh, Chair Love and members of the delegation, good evening once again. I'm Jason Sartori, Director of the Montgomery County Planning Department, and I thank you for this opportunity to testify on MC 10-24 and thank Majority Leader Moon for its introduction. The Maryland National Capital Park and Planning Commission supports MC 10-24 with an amendment. The 20 is plenty concept, the idea that 20 miles per hour is a sufficient speed limit for residential areas has taken off globally. Speed is directly related to both the likelihood of crashes and their severity. Lower speed limits lead to lower speeds, which result in fewer crashes and fewer serious life-altering crashes. Lower speeds help the county achieve Vision Zero. This bill would help facilitate the county's ability to achieve Vision Zero, therefore we support the bill. One amendment we would suggest is to allow for speed monitor monitoring after one year. As currently written, state code would not ever allow new speed monitoring on roads where the speed limit is decreased. This will hinder implementation of this safety measure. Again, the Commission supports the intent of this legislation as it would facilitate Montgomery County's ability to reduce speed limits and achieve its Vision Zero goals, and, request, we, and we request a favorable, favorable vote in support of MC 10-24 with amendment. Thank you. Excuse my misstep before. Uh, so I will uh, not repeat what you've heard uh, often this evening uh, in detail that uh, speed kills. Reducing speed limits is an effective safety measure. Uh, that is uh, granted, I hope, it is demonstrated by numerous studies. So there is a real problem here, and there is a precedent for the solution that is before you, uh, which is in state code. It is in Traffic Article 21803, Section 5, which states that Baltimore City may, without performing an engineering and traffic investigation, decrease the maximum speed limit on a highway under its jurisdiction. There already is an exclusion in state code that is very close to the exclusion that we're asking you for this evening. Uh, I testified to this effect uh, earlier this year in the 2023 sec, uh, session, and Delegate Regina Boyce pointed out that the reason that that exclusion is in state code is that the city of Baltimore enacted a complete streets policy prior to, in a timely manner, so that Baltimore received that exclusion. Montgomery County now has a complete streets policy. We have a complete streets design guide. Thank you, Montgomery Planning. Thank you to the Montgomery County Council that enacted it. 
the Complete Streets Design Guide uh, designates five different types of roads in Montgomery County uh, for a 20 mile an hour speed limit, as Mr. Sartori mentioned. Uh, those are downtown streets, neighborhood connectors, neighborhood streets, neighborhood yield streets, and certain county road segments that operate as neighborhood streets. So we have an active request from Montgomery Planning for speed limit reduction to 20 miles an hour. We know that the speed limit reduction is effective. We have a precedent in the form of Baltimore's exclusion from the bill that uh, from the uh, state law, the exclusion that we're um, asking you to um, enact this evening. Uh, so uh, further, I'll say this is county supported. The County's pedestrian master plan that was enacted just a few months ago includes recommendation P9, which is, quote, comprehensively lower speed limits countywide, with detail that explains, again, quoting, higher traffic speeds are directly linked to crash severity. In pursuit of Vision Zero, the county should continue efforts to lower speed limits in neighborhoods and along major roadways with the goal of having the roadways posted speed limit match the target speeds outlined in the complete streets design guide. The 20 mile an hour target speeds that I just noted. Recommendation 9A of the master plan, the pedestrian master plan recommended by Montgomery Planning, approved by the planning board and the county council is in detail. Montgomery County's ability to lower posted and statutory speed limits along residential streets is limited by state law. The county should support all legislation that offers local agencies more flexibility in setting speed limits in line with county goals. That is this legislation that is before you now. Uh, finally, I will address why this uh, requirement for an engineering and traffic investigation exists. If you'll indulge another 20 seconds, uh, a former if, colleague of yours from District 17. If you could wrap it up, Mr. Grimes, we've, you've had a lot of time tonight. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Go ahead. Good evening, uh, I, I will be brief. Um, the metrics on speed killing are definitive and have been studied numerous times. There's a study that shows that the risk of death for a pedestrian is 10% if the car is going 25 miles an hour, 25% if 32 miles an hour, 50% if going over 40 miles an hour, and on and on. We know that this is true. We know that speed kills, and yet we have this requirement in state law that there be a very expensive street-by-street -street traffic study in order to lower speed limits. It took, I think, a year or two, uh, Delegate Solomon can correct me if I'm wrong, to lower the speed limit on Georgia Avenue in my neighborhood from 35 to 30. But that does make a difference. And we will have less people dying on our roads if we are able to obviate the need for a street-by-street -street, uh, study and take the complete streets design that has been adopted by the county and the pedestrian master plan that have been adopted by the county and the recommendation from the county council that this kind of bill go forward. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right, good evening again. <laughs> um, I submitted written comments, so I'll, I'll keep it brief as well. Uh, I live near the intersection of Sligo Avenue and Piney Branch Road in Silver Spring. Almost a year ago, on December 23, 2022, a 22-year-old driver lost control and crashed, killing himself and injuring his two passengers. I cross the street multiple times a day with my dog, and each time I have to walk by a demolished brick retaining wall that that car crashed into. I know the family who lives in the house above that wall. It's a, a young couple and their two little kids. Uh, it's a reminder that one day it could be me, right? You know, I grew up here and my mental map of this county is filled with places where I know somebody. Uh, I love a friend, a former classmate, uh, was hurt or killed in, in a car crash. and. Requiring a study just to reduce a speed limit would only increase the likelihood that another tragedy occurs, right? Um, as I mentioned, I worked as a transportation planner for a decade. Uh, it is not the only thing that we could do. There are a lot of these streets, Piney Branch Road is one of them, where engineering is probably needed. Uh, but uh, a lower speed limit is, is just the first step to making that street safer, and it's one that we should move as quickly as we can on. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, good evening. Uh, John Sang, Chair of Safe Roads Maryland again. I'll use all of 20 seconds. Uh, Safe Roads Maryland wholeheartedly supports MC 1024, uh, and we encourage your favorable recommendation. When I read this bill, I had to read it a couple of times to you know completely understand it, but uh, from the get-go, I really felt a sense of urgency about it and putting safety first. So those two key points 
So uh, Safe Roads Mayor would appreciate your um, recommendation favorably. Thank you. Okay. Thank you all. Any questions for this panel? Delegate Kaufman. Yes, very briefly. I just wanted to, and please be brief, Mr. Grimes, but I did want to let you finish uh, that little 30-second story. Yeah, I, I directly checked with a former colleague of yours uh, from District 17 who is responsible, he told me, for the insertion of the engineering and traffic investigation requirement in the bill. Uh, he said uh, that he used the word politicize. This was to depoliticize. Uh, speed limit reductions are no longer considered political in the intervening years. We have, as you've heard, recognized that speed limit reduction is effective in boosting safety, and it is widely practiced, uh, as Mr. Sartori said. It's no longer a political issue. The reason for this requirement is no longer uh, – we, we have planning documents that support uh, elimination of the requirement. It's no longer justified. Thank you, Madam Chair. Seeing no further questions, that concludes the hearing on MC 1024. We now turn to MC 724, Chair Polakovich Carr. Good evening, colleagues. Thank you, Madam Chair. For the record, I'm Delegate Julie Polakovich Carr here to present MC 724. So we're continuing on the theme of roadway safety with this legislation. And I just want to take a step back because we've had a lot of discussion about, or at least allusions to Vision Zero so far tonight, and actually just talk a little bit about the history of that and how this bill and actually some others that we're hearing tonight fit into that context. So um, back in 2019, Maryland became the fourth state to adopt a goal of Vision Zero. And this is a goal of having no deaths or serious injuries on our roadways. Um, Montgomery County, the city of Rockville, and numerous other local jurisdictions in Maryland actually adopted this goal prior to the state. Um, but we've been trying to make progress on that for a few years. Um, but Vision Zero really is rooted in a, a data-driven analysis and also just with a kind of a foundational belief that there is no accidents, and that's come up tonight too, that crashes that happen are, can be due to human error, but just because a human has made a mistake doesn't mean our systems should actually fail. And we take a similar approach when we think about aviation safety, about nuclear power plants. We don't accept that accidents happen if a plane crashes. Um, so other jurisdictions, especially around the world, have made a lot of progress with the Vision Zero uh, and, and using this approach. Um, so a couple of months ago, the county council unanimously passed uh, a piece of legislation with the support of the county executive that furthers their implementation of Vision Zero. And one specific uh, part of that new county law is the foundation of the bill that's before you tonight. Uh, they were looking specifically at crashes that happen in more urban parts of our county, the more densely populated and built up areas of the county. and. Um, intersections in those areas on state roadways and uh, basically requiring two specific safety um, interventions going forward in on those county roads and that is a prohibition on right turns on red as well as leading pedestrian intervals this is just giving a pedestrian or bicyclist a head start before traffic has a green light and these really are proven tactics that have helped to reduce crashes in other jurisdictions that have adopted them um, notably, these are, are two strategies that, in fact, our State Highway Administration also recommends for more urban areas in what they consider to be urban core or urban center, which, of which there are six in our county. Uh, so the bill before you mirrors this new county law, but for state roadways, these actually are the deadliest roadways in Montgomery County. And if we look across the state, state roadways really are the big problem uh, and would adopt uh, these, these two same safety provisions for state roadways uh, in more urban parts of the county. Um, let me just lastly note that uh, in our written files for tonight, SHA did share a letter of concern today. They shared that with me this afternoon as well. Uh, we will be meeting in the near future to kind of talk through their fiscal concerns around the bill. Um, but again, I, I would just leave you all with this bill really is about making SHA do the things that they already recommend in their context-driven guide for these specific areas. But I'm happy to work with them to address their concerns on that. Happy to take any questions. Thank you. Any questions for the sponsor? Okay, seeing none, let's call up our panel. Uh, Christy Daphnis, Peter Gray, Seth Grimes, John Sang, Mindy Baden, Jason Sartori. <clears throat> Who's going first? <laughs> <laughs> I noticed that. 
Okay, thank you uh, for one last time this evening, I promise. Uh, I'm Jason Sartori, Montgomery County Planning Director. Thank you for the opportunity to testify on MC 7-24, and th I thank uh, Chair Polakovich Carr for the bill's introduction. The Maryland National Capital Park and Planning Commission supports MC 7-24, but recommends a clarifying amendment. Earlier this year, as Chair Polakovich Carr mentioned, the County Council adopted the Safe Streets Act of 2023 to create safer streets for all users, pedestrians, cyclists, and drivers on roadways in the county. The act requires leading pedestrian intervals and prohibits right turns on red lights on county-owned roads in our downtown and town center areas. MC 7-24 serves as an apt extension of the Safe Streets Act by applying similar requirements to state roads in our urban areas. As a key partner in the county's Vision Zero efforts, any initiative or policy uh, that supports safer and more walkable communities are of utmost concern and importance to the planning department. Therefore, we support this bill. However, we, we respectfully recommend that the delegation include language that more clearly identifies the boundaries of the applicable areas to facilitate implementation of the bill. For consistency with the Safe Streets Act, the bill could be amended to apply to areas designated by the county as town centers or downtowns. Alternatively, SHA could update its context-driven areas to clearly define the boundaries of the urban core and urban center designations used in the bill. Our policy statement on this gives an example of the concern that we have over how clearly those areas are def currently defined by SHA. Uh, to further grow complete communities, Montgomery Planning has and continues to draft master plans that are geared toward making Montgomery County a world-class bicycling and walkable community. In fact, the Montgomery County recently approved the pedestrian master plan, which specifically calls for the types of changes prescribed by this bill. There are many state roads that run through the county, and this bill would make them safer in our more urbanized areas with higher pedestrian volumes. For those reasons, we request a favorable vote in support of MC 7-24 with amendments to more clearly define where it applies. Thank you. Thank you. Seth Grimes, Washington Area Bicyclist Association. We support MC 724. Uh, we do appreciate that this is consistent with Montgomery County's Safe Streets Act. Uh, Council President Glass was here earlier, and maybe he would have testified in any case. Uh, we do thank the county for that. Uh, consistency across urban areas is important. If you are in downtown Silver Spring and on Fenton Street and no turn on red is uh, not allowed because uh, turn on red is not allowed because it is a, uh, an urban core area. If you go one block to Georgia Avenue or to Colesville, the same rules should apply. Consistency through, through an area is important. Um, we do appreciate that this bill links the definitions to the urban core and urban center within the state's context driven. Uh, I do know because I've talked to the State Highway Administration about this recently, they consider context driven to be a living document, that is their words. Uh, so while change, changes are uh, possible here, uh, but uh, the application of context driven will mean that this law will apply to other areas in Montgomery County, such as, oh, you know, maybe Germantown or Gaithersburg if they do gain urban designations. In any case, uh, without belaboring it, WABA supports MC724 and hopes that you will advance it. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. Peter Gray from Bike Maryland. Um, <laughs> I just want to say uh, no turn on red, um, was, right on red was something that was established back in the 70s after the uh, oil crisis and we didn't want cars idling unnecessarily. I think that the safety implications of uh, allowing people to turn right on red have now been fully recognized. It makes it much less safe for people to bike or walk across an intersection if there's a car that's going to be coming uh, around the corner, even at a red light. Likewise, leading pedestrian intervals are now state of the art and give everybody, drivers, pedestrians, cyclists, a clear signal as to when it's their turn to go by allowing a few seconds to let pedestrians and cyclists enter the intersection, they're more visible to the cars and thus less likely to be hit. And so we support uh, MC 724. Thank you. Thank you. Hello again. My name is Mindy Baden. 
My son Brett died in January 2020. He was struck by a car as he was crossing Rockville Pike. He's the reason I'm here tonight. In the years since his death, I have supported the Safe Streets Act of 2023, which was recently voted into law by the Montgomery County Council. Among other things, as Delegate Paklovich Carr mentioned, the law prohibits right turns on red in urban areas. It also provides extra crossing time and LPIs for pedestrians and bicyclists in those urban areas. As soon as I read the Safe Streets Act, I knew I needed to support it. I was there and I spoke when the bill was introduced. I provided testimony and support. I was there when it was voted into law. I was there when I spoke at the bill signing. I was there again to provide testimony to fund the new law. And I was there for, dis for the discussion of how the funding would be used to implement the new law. Although I'm encouraged that the new law will be a huge benefit for non-motorists, there was always that piece missing that the law applied only to county roads and not to state roads. Now there's a chance to approve MC 724 to provide these same safeguards to state roads and to complete the circle to make all the roads and urban areas in Montgomery County safer for pedestrians, bicyclists, and rollers, and to help achieve the Vision Zero goals. But the work needs to continue to eliminate all traffic fatalities. People are losing their lives on our roadways, and families like mine are left grieving. We're not abstract numbers and statistics. In memory of my son, Brett, I'm requesting passage of this bill, and please honor him and all those whose lives were lost in crashes by passing MC 724. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mindy. Uh, I work with Mindy very closely uh, with the GOCA uh, organization that Helene represented earlier, and I have to say uh, she's one of my, you know, major motivations to uh, keep doing what we're doing across the state of Maryland. Uh, Safe Roads Maryland, I'm John Sang, Chair. Safe Roads Maryland stands 100% behind MC 724, and uh, uh, look forward to your approval of that. Um, when I first read this bill and I looked at all the, you know, bold-faced language here, I was like, yes, 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 of course, yes. So we stand behind it 100%. Uh, we uh, transcend Montgomery County because I know all of you will then, you know, head to Annapolis come January. We have uh, similar uh, folks uh, representing Safe Roads Maryland uh, testifying in Prince George's County this evening, I believe, as we speak. And we also operate in Baltimore County, too. I would ask each of you to uh, keep road safety top priority as you head up to Annapolis and hopefully it goes viral um, and uh, so thank you very much for your uh, support for this bill thank you good evening everyone <clears throat> my name is Christy Daphnis uh, I'm one of the founding uh, steering committee members for Montgomery County Families for Safe Streets first I'd like to thank all of you for the importance that you've put on road safety tonight and in previous bills in this session and in past sessions um, those of you that I've seen at roadside memorials whether it be in the freezing cold or in the rain um, it's very much appreciated because it shows family members that the lives of their loved ones matter um, so thank you for that <clears throat> um, I and did not testify in the other hearings or in the other uh, sessions tonight, but I just wanted to mention that we also support 6 24, 10 24, 11 24, and 19 24. Um, so I just wanted to note that in the record. Um, this bill is actually quite simple uh, implementation of leading pedestrian intervals and, and no right on red at state highway intersections is a really important companion to the recently passed Safe Streets Act, as others have mentioned. Um, both are pre proven safety interventions. Um, mirroring the county requirements at the state level in Montgomery County will reduce driver confusion and drive consistency with the compliance of, of, both, uh, of the, both of those items. These are both important elements and aspects to improving safety. To the extent possible, we should be using traffic control devices and signage to, to separate and prevent conflicts amongst uh, drivers, pedestrians, bicyclists, and others. And this bill will help to do that. It, it's consistent with that goal, and I urge you to report favorably. I just want to use the last few seconds that I have here to 
address something, a question that um, Delegate Foley asked in the last in the last segment, where she asked about education. Delegate Moon was very delicate in saying, you know, maybe I'll consider that. I urge you to not consider that. I will tell you, I invite every single one of you to come to my neighborhood where middle schoolers cross Fierce Mill Road at Newport Mill. Sixth graders, seventh graders, eighth graders, ninth through twelfth graders, they all cross Fierce Mill Road. There's not a sidewalk on one side of Fierce Mill Road. A man was killed on Fierce Mill in Newport Mill in May. And my ninth grader crosses the street there every day, twice a day. In the past several years, kids have been hit in crosswalks following the law. No amount of education is going to stop that. And you could say, oh, we'll give them a bus or give them a crossing guard. That's not going to happen. And the crossing guard cannot be there all the time. And what is the crossing guard going to do when someone is driving 49 miles an hour or 59 miles an hour and blows through a red light? Because, oh, guess what? We also cannot put a red light camera there or speed monitoring there at that intersection. We've asked, and it's been denied. It took six years for me to get a traffic signal a block, down the, a, a block down the road where kids were crossing the street. So I invite you all to come take a look in my neighborhood where 80% of the students get free or reduced meals. Please wrap it up. Yeah, that's Thank all. You. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any questions for this panel? Okay, seeing none, thank you all very much. Um, Ms. Baden and Ms. Uh, Daphnis, thank you both for your advocacy on behalf of those victims. We truly appreciate it. That concludes the hearing on MC 724, and we are entering our last bill of the evening. Last but not least, <laughs> Delegate Solomon, MC 1524. Please do. I will get started, uh, and I know that I am all that stands between a uh, warm bed, potentially dinner, and the second half of uh, Monday Night Football, if you're, uh, if you're interested. So I will try to be brief. Um, I, I'm going to spare, I think we've heard enough tonight about really the horrible statistics that we've got, not only on our county roads, but our state roads um, within the county. Um, you know, you've heard all the statistics on speed and and why it's really important for us to, to make changes to driver behavior and to put in place infrastructure that, that changes those dynamics. So I'm going to skip through all of this. Um, you know, basically what this bill does is it expands the authority for the county to place additional automated traffic enforcement speed cameras on additional spots in the road. And this is um, it's a retread of a bill. Um, we brought this last year um, to try to give the county additional authority. Um, it was a little bit broader last year, and I know there's been a lot of ongoing conversation within the General Assembly on sort of what those dynamics are going to be. So um, I really appreciate the very thoughtful debate and conversation that we had with, with colleagues last year, um, both in the delegation and within, um, within the full assembly. So what we did was we, we tweaked this bill to, to change it rather than just sort of broad authority based on speed limit to be much more targeted. Um, and so what the bill does is it would give the county uh, additional authority to place speed cameras on roads or corridors that are classified as um, high injury networks. Um, and so what that is, the high injury networks are basically 3% of the total roadways within Montgomery County, both municipalities or municipalities, counties, and state roads. Um, so it's 3% of the total road mileage within, within the entire county. And of, those three per, of that 3% of the roads, those high injury networks make up 41% of the serious and fatal crashes. So it is the sort of worst of the worst uh, in terms of safety locations within the county. And what it would do is give the, give the county just the authority to put those cameras, to put cameras on that corridor, that network of roads. Um, and you might say, well, aren't they already sort of eligible? Well, there's a list, and I'm not, uh, I was looking online, I'm not sure that we, we uploaded it, and we can share this with the delegation. There's 41 locations that are listed in this document that the county prepared. Um, 
that are actually currently ineligible for, for speed cameras. So right now the county can basically only put a, a camera on a road that is 35 miles an hour or below or uh, a residential corridor, I guess three locations, or a, um, a, high, um, a school zone, and that's it. So there are 41 um, locations that the county has identified that fall within those high injury network corridors that are either speed limit is too high or they're technically classified as a, as a commercial district or both. Um, and so this would give them the opportunity to be able to place cameras on, again, the most unsafe locations within the county. Um, the other piece is we wanted to make sure that the money goes specifically to the areas where, you know, similar to what you heard from, from Delegate Moon, we wanted to make sure the money was going to the places where the problems are. So we specifically say that the funding, uh, the, whatever revenue is generated from these cameras, um, obviously first and foremost funds the infrastructure for the camera itself, but then is used to fund improvements along these high injury network corridors. Um, so again, the money, you know, this is not meant to be a revenue grab. I know that that was expressed earlier today. Um, and I think, you know, again, our county does, I think we have one of the, the best gold standard programs in the country, and you're gonna hear from, from folks in the county. Um, you know, this is not meant to be a revenue grab. This is meant to slow people down, make our roads safer, and then ultimately lead to whatever revenue is generated going back into the infrastructure and improving, uh, improving those spots. Um, and then finally, the evaluation uh, that we have written in the bill is every five years because the county identifies the high injury network every five years. Although I know that the State Highway Administration mentioned that they might be open to something less frequent or more frequent, we'd be open to that as well. Um, the last piece I will mention is, you know, SHA um, had a couple of, of minor tweaks in the bill. I, I think maybe they were just reading it a little incorrectly, so we're more than open to whatever. They had a letter of intent. We're open to continuing to work with SHA to make sure that we got, we got the verbiage in the bill correct. And they did mention that they wanted us to change the phrase accident to crash. Obviously, um, you know, we know that accident has a specific connotation. I think when we drafted this bill, we were trying to be consistent with what is in code um, throughout statute. So um, obviously we believe crash is better, but when we drafted the bill, it was to be consistent with code, but we're happy to, we, we would prefer crash, but we wanna make sure we're, we're being correct with the code within, uh, within the rest of state statute. And with that, I would, uh, I would ask a favorable report. Thank you, any questions for the sponsor? Okay, we'll go ahead with the panel, thank you. Great. Um, the hour is late. Um, uh, I'm Sarah Morningstar with the Office of Intergovernmental Relations. I just wanted to uh, express the, um, the county executive and the county council's support for this bill and appreciation to Delegate Solomon for bringing it forward. Um, speed kills, cameras work, and we hope that this bill passes. Thank you. That's how it's done, people. Nice. <laughs> Who wants to go next? <laughs> Speed record, good, good job. Uh, my name is Wade Holm, I'm the Vision Zero Coordinator with the Office of the County Executive, also here to support Bill MC1524. We've talked about the stats, we talked about why these are important for the high injury network. Uh, it's very high concentration number of serious and fatal crashes, so we don't really focus on these roads, we're not gonna make progress on Vision Zero. Um, that's why we wanna make sure, a huge part of our Vision Zero action plan is to, to make sure we can use all the tools that are available to us on all of these roads, and state law currently forbids one of the most effective tools we can put on immediately to these roadways. We did an analysis of the high injury network that's in our current 2030 action plan. Basically half of the network is ineligible for speed cameras. So eliminating this artificial barrier to the, it, through this built in through state law is important for us, but also want to ensure people that we're not going to automatically throw cameras up. We're still going to follow the same procedures we have in place as part of our nationally recognized speed camera program. They will be studied to make sure that the problem that needs to be fixed on the road, if it's speeding, that's what the speed cameras will go up. If we don't have a speed problem, if it's another issue on the network, you know, that would be, be part of our assessment. So the enabling legislation is very important for us. It's a core part of our Vision Zero Action Plan, and we hope for a favorable report. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Good evening, Madam Chair. Uh, distinguished members of the committee. My name is Michael Paler. I'm the Chief of Traffic Engineering for Montgomery County's DOT. I wanted to express uh, DOT support for uh, MC1524. Um, not to belabor the point and echo what Mr. Wade Holland said, but when we look at law enforcement or speed enforcement as a component of uh, a comprehensive safety assessment and evaluation of a roadway in conjunction with roadway improvements, and education and other factors. We believe this is a vital 
part of that component. And um, without it, it will leave our programs incomplete and not fulfill the safety obligations that we have to the uh, citizens and residents of Montgomery County. So we express our support for this and hope you will too. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, thank you for uh, having this bill hearing this evening. And I'm Chris Debris. I'm the Director of Automated Traffic for Montgomery County Police Department. And I'm here to also support MC 1524. Again, this is um, was a reintroduction from a bill last year. And we feel that this is going to be a, a positive move um, to reduce serious crashes in the county. And um, uh, I just appreciate your support. Thank you. Any questions for this panel? Chair Polakovich Carr. Thank you, Madam Chair. Just a request to the county partners, since there was a mention about the, the, that analysis. I don't see that in our written record. If we could see that those locations that are currently ineligible, I think that would just be helpful. Thank you. Thank you. Delegate Spiegel. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, in looking at the portion of the bill uh, that addresses the allocation of uh, the extra amount of money uh, from the fines collected, uh, I'm seeing language that talks about uh, money collected from uh, cameras uh, operated by municipal governments going to uh, study design and construction of safety related projects on roadways or intersections that have been identified in the county's local strategic highway safety plan or vision zero plan. And I, I don't know if any of the panel members know the answer to this question here on the spot, but I'm curious just to make sure that um, locations within municipalities where there may be cameras operating are always going to be covered by the county's Vision Zero plan or Strategic Highway Safety plan, uh, particularly in those municipalities that have their own independent land use and zoning authority. That may be a place where we need to make sure that language is synced up between these two sections because then if you look in the later part of the bill, it mentions, you know, if the city, like Cedar Rockwell has a Vision Zero action plan, Gaithersburg is going to start on one, we're poking Tacoma Park to start one as well. Because um, they would obviously, at a city level, have a different kind of network they're identifying for their roads. So we want to make sure that, and they also operate their own speed camera programs. So we want to make sure that, as for us, the county, we want to be able to use our county dollars to fix our county roads. We want to also make sure that this, the cities and municipalities have that ability as well to use that camera revenue to work on their um, higher network, whatever they call it, in their action plans. Thank you. I, th I think you completely understood my question. I appreciate that answer. I think there might need to be a tweak to that language as a result. Thank you. Any further questions? Delegate Chi. Thank you, Madam Chair. Actually, it's not a question. I just want to take this opportunity to personally thank Mr. Michael Paler for your extraordinary service in ensuring the pedestrian safety. Uh, I'm a, a very satisfied delegate in terms of my, uh, in, in terms of your responsiveness and your. Um, in many cases, uh, being very helpful in our office requests for anything related to not only MCDOT, but in coordinating with the State Highway Administration and MDOT um, in addressing a lot of the sidewalk, crosswalk, and pedestrian safety issues in our vast district. So thank you very much for your service. Delegate Chi, you're very, very welcome. Thank you. <laughs> okay, seeing no further questions for this panel, our final panel of the evening, Seth Grimes, Peter Gray, John Sang, Christy Daphnis. Mr. Grimes, lead us off. Thank you. Uh, safety is a core element of WABA's mission, uh, uh, road safety in particular. Uh, automated speed enforcement systems are an essential safety tool, and it is entirely appropriate that the balance of enforcement funds sh fines should be targeted to enhance safety at our county's most dangerous roadway locations. Therefore, WABA supports MC1524. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Peter Gray, Bike, Maryland. Um, 
Some of the, the delegates here have been to memorials that we have had on New Hampshire Avenue, on Georgia Avenue, on uh, River Road, other places. Um, the high injury network reflects uh, locations where crashes have happened repeatedly. And we need uh, measures like MC1524 to help ameliorate and improve those repeat offenders. These are systemic issues, and it's appropriate that fines uh, from automated traffic enforcement, which is a proven safety uh, measure, go to uh, help fix those locations. And it shouldn't be taking us years to do these things, and we should apply these things expeditiously yeah. and uh, so that we don't have more Brett Badens and, 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 and other uh, victims of crashes. Thank you. Thank you. Hello again, John Tseng, Chair of Safe Roads Maryland. Uh, we urge the delegation to give a favorable recommendation to MC 15-24. Stop the bleeding. Um, speed cameras work and uh, they need to be done right, no question about it. Thank you for your attention and action and sense of urgency. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Christy Daphnis. Um, I won't read everything I've written here because most of it has been said. Speed enforcement works. I wish Delegate um, Acevedo were still here because to those people who get ticked off about getting a speeding ticket, I would simply say, go the speed limit and you won't have to pay a speeding ticket. Um, we need this bill because we need the ability to put cameras in unsafe locations and we need the ability to use the money generated and the data collected to fix those areas. This bill will allow us to do that and allow us a better framework to do this in Montgomery County, uh, piggybacking on some of the requirements that are already in place and, and the things we take into consideration when we place speed cameras. Um, 550 deaths per year in the state of Maryland on our roadways is way too many. And this will be one way to help us uh, get that lower. So thank you, everyone. Thank you. Are there any questions for this panel? Okay, seeing none, that concludes the hearing on MC1524. That also concludes the hearings for the Land Use, Transportation, and Public Safety Committee bills. I turn it back to you, Chair Polakovich Carr. Thank you, Chair Love. As a reminder, this is just the first step in the process for all of these bills. For the public who'd like to keep abreast of uh, next steps for any of this legislation, you can track upcoming work sessions on our delegation website. And I would also suggest folks sign up for to receive periodic updates from our delegation, and that sign up form is also on our website. Uh, and I think with that, I will turn it over to Senator Kramer to close us out for tonight. Happy holidays, everybody. We are adjourned. Jump! Hup, jump! High, high, higher, higher!